privilege to welcome you all to the opening of the 21st Human Dimension Implementation Meeting here in Warsaw. My first HDIM as ODIL Director. Let me start by welcoming our distinguished speakers, thanking them for accepting our invitation and being able to join us this morning. Traditionally, we will start with opening remarks by our distinguished guests. Uh, first, uh, we will hear an address by the distinguished Foreign Minister of Poland, Mr. Witold Waszczykowski, representing the government of our generous host country. The Polish government has been an invaluable partner and supporter of our work for more than a quarter of a century, and it is thanks to the minister's personal support that we are gathered in this superb new venue. Uh, then we will hear introductory remarks from our chairmanship in office, the uh, vice minister for foreign affairs of the Republic of Austria, Ambassador uh, Michael Linhardt. Uh, next, we will hear some words from the OSCE Secretary General, Ambassador Thomas Greminger. While this is his first address at HDIM in his new capacity as Secretary General, Ambassador Greminger has been a frequent visitor to HDIM in the past years and also gave an opening address in 2014 at that time on behalf of the Swiss Chairmanship. I'm also very much looking forward to hearing introductory remarks from my colleagues of the other two OSCE institutions, the OSCE High Commissioner on National Minorities, Ambassador Lamberto Chanier, as well as the OSCE Representative on Freedom of the Media, Mr. Arlen Desir. The two will be followed by Ms. Mariette Diday, the Vice President of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, from our close and trusted partners, representing parliamentarians from the entire OSCE region. Uh, now, uh, we will turn to our first speaker, the Foreign Minister of Poland, Mr. Witold Waszczykowski. Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Director, for the opening speech and introduction. Um, welcome you to the annual Human Dimension Implementation Meeting in Warsaw. This year, for the uh, first time, we gather in the new venue uh, in the National Stadium Conference uh, Center. The place is uh, very successful because this is a home of our successful sports uh, teams, and also it was successful for political reason because last year, uh, in July, a uh, very successful NATO meeting was organized actually in this place. So I hope that uh, this is a good luck also for, the, for this meeting. This year edition of the HDIM is also special for another reason. We have with us the newly appointed Secretary General of the OSC and heads of all its institutions. Therefore, first of all, let me welcome warmly the new Secretary General, Mr. Thomas Greminger, the High Commissioner on National Minorities, Mr. Lamberto Zanier, and uh, representative of uh, freedom of the media, Mr. Hallem Bezil. As the Minister of Foreign uh, Affairs of the host country of the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, I would like to kindly greet uh, Madam uh, Gisla Dotil, the new director of Audio. Madam Director, so welcome to uh, Warsaw. I wish you very success in fulfilling the task ahead of you. I'm uh, convinced uh, that under your leadership, the office will uh, maintain a high level of competence and independence, while at the same time effectively advancing the cause of human rights. <clears throat> Let me also commend, the and especially the leadership of today not present uh, with us, uh, Sebastian Kurz, who demonstrated his valuable abilities and firm commitment during a series of difficult negotiations at the crucial time for the organization. Last but not uh, least, I would like to welcome all representatives of the OSC Parliamentary uh, Assembly and in particular its Vice President, Madam Marietta uh, T. Day. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we uh, gathered here today against the 
backdrop of a serious security risk in the OSC area. I'm glad to say, however, that the organization proved to become an indispensable actor in the field of crisis management, in particular with regard to the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Yet, uh, we all have to acknowledge that in a current unstable security scenario, there is no space for being complacent. First of all, we need to make better use of the existing instruments aimed at rebuilding trust and confidence. Poland will continue its efforts to modernize the existing Vienna document. We are particularly committed to improving risk reduction mechanisms, including those concerning dangerous military incidents. Speaking of, about the OSC itself, it's worth underlying once again that the organization provides a truly unique platform for building comprehensive security, especially because all its dimensions are interdependent and interrelated. Speaking about the human dimension, we do not omit the critically important political military context. And at the same time, considering the political issues, we do not forget about the respect for human rights and democratic values. These rights and values, which are often put in jeopardy during crisis situation, constitute an inseparable part of every far-reaching solution. We recognize the structured dialogue on the current and future challenges and risk to security, launched after the Hamburg Ministerial, as a serious and important exercise. While not prejudging its uh, outcomes, we think that this process offers a chance to improve our mutual understanding. Should the structural dialogue be conducted properly and all participating states engage seriously, it might facilitate bringing the OSC back, to, back on track. Similarly, we consider this conference, the Human Dimension Implementation Meeting, to be an important tool which can not only help us return to the full respect of the OSC commitments through constructive dialogue and trust, but also supersede the attitude of aggressive confrontation which we have witnessed on several occasions. I would like to uh, thank the Director Gisla Dotti and her team for the effective cooperation and for organizing this conference. The HDIM is the largest and the most ambitious platform for dialogue on human rights issues across the OSC region, allowing governments and civil society to take stock of the situation in the OSC area and to discuss openly potential ways of advancing the implementation of our commitments. Poland highly values the work of the ODIR and its crucial role in building public confidence in the governance process, thus strengthening democratic societies and accountable institutions across the OSC area, particularly through its electoral assistance. Last year, we jointly celebrated 25 years of the establishment of ODIR in Warsaw, and we look forward to more many years of good cooperation. In this context, I'm pleased to announce that we have recently signed the host country agreement, which consolidates the OSC and thereby other legal status in Poland. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that this edition of uh, Human Dimension Implementation Meeting gives us all the opportunity to join constructive and substantive discussion focused on concrete human rights issues. Expecting that during the 2017 Ministerial Council we will make progress in the third dimension, I hope that this year HDIM discussions will bring us closer to reaching an agreement on the major goals we wish to achieve this year. I thank you for the attention and uh, hope that you will have a very successful uh, meeting uh, uh, in this premises, but also very enjoyable stay in Warsaw. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister. And now I give the floor to Ambassador Michael Linhardt, Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs of Austria, who speaks on behalf of the chairmanship. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sehr geehrte Frau Madam Director, Ms. Gisle Dotte, Minister 
Wasikowski, Secretary General uh, Thomas Kreminger, Alam Desir, Nabato Zanier. It's a pleasure for me to greet you on behalf of the chairmanship in office at this Human Dimension Implementation Meeting. We have two intensive weeks of work ahead of us as representatives of the OSE states and institutions, we have the opportunity to discuss issues with uh, experts, with uh, representatives of people. Over the last 12 months, we have had the chance to look at our commitments to human rights and the rule of law and democracy and see how we've managed to implement those. It's this shared responsibility and the dialogue between states and civil society which make this meeting unique. It's an opportunity to see how well we have done our work. The Paris Charter and the Copenhagen document of the human dimension are really still the foundation upon which we are building. It provides, or these provide, a common ground for our work. The respect for human rights and democracy is the precondition for a peaceful, secure life together in the OSEE area. We will be looking at the commitments under these agreements. We'll also be looking at new challenges to peace and security. And the challenges to human rights come from a number of different factors, such as migration, uh, the refugee crisis, the threat of increasing terrorism and radicalization, and many different kinds of threats in cyberspace. They affect us all, and that is why we need to better join forces with the clear objective of mitigating the negative impact on human rights and fundamental freedoms. In order to do that, we need human rights mainstreaming in the OSCE through all dimensions and activities of our organization. It's absolutely clear that the respect of human rights, the rule of law, and democracy cannot be achieved at the cost of security and stability. Quite the opposite. They strengthen security and stability. They have a mutually beneficial relationship, and they're fundamental part of the comprehensive security philosophy of the OSCE. Trust between and within states is crucial for this. And we cannot undermine trust if we want to ensure a peaceful future for our region. We need to provide examples for other regions. The current example of the Rohingya shows this clearly. Building trust needs an open and permanently constructive dialogue. Free media here is key with uh, journalists who inform us about the issues affecting our lives. And it is because of the courage of such journalists who work under discrimination, excesses of violence, and report on these issues, as well as the abuse of power and corruption. They face intimidation. They face imprisonment on an increasing basis. And the attacks that we are seeing are unfortunately uh, a phenomenon which is increasing in scale. They, these journalists play a crucial role for human rights, and the attacks that they face, as well as the attacks on freedom of opinion, is something that we need to stand up against. We need to promote pluralism, protect the media, and also ensure that impunity of these acts cannot be tolerated. A further priority of our national foreign policy, uh, which is something that um, our chairmanship has been focusing on, is gender equality. 
from economic disadvantage to discrimination to uh, gender conflict. There are many different conflicts which need to be understood and addressed. The Gender Equality Review Conference this June can facilitate a healthy dialogue with, but within civil society and between states as well. And we could see many, um, we could see many positive developments. It's an important contribution to the chairmanship of the of Austria. And we hope very much that it will impact not just our chairmanship, but the whole of the region. The fight against intolerance and discrimination is something that we've also particularly um, emphasized this year. We don't just want to counter discrimination, but we want to promote tolerance. Individual differences are no pretext, can not be a pretext for separation. They cannot undermine our democratic societies. Tolerance is essential for integrating new citizens as well, particularly in the context of tension and increasing challenges. We can only do our work in this organization if the management positions are occupied by qualified individuals. And I'm very happy that we've managed to achieve together uh, We've managed to achieve this together uh, after much effort. We know the excellent work that the independent institutions do as uh, the chairmanship in office, and I'm sure uh, you would share that with us. So I'd like to uh, thank uh, the excellent work that's been done in the independent institutions, the ODEA, the High Representative, and the High Commissioner, the Special Representative and the High Commissioner. They do extremely important work um, in the areas that they occupy, the representative for the freedom of media, the high commissioner for the national minorities, and oh dear. They need to be able to do their work uh, without facing obstacles. And in that way, they can promote peace and security throughout our region. So it's essential that we, as OSCE countries, also practice uh, self-scrutiny and constantly review our position. Uh, and our work on human rights, both in our countries and throughout the region. Now, this kind of self-scrutiny isn't uh, something that can be done without preparation, but we've been doing this kind of work for years. We've amassed a huge amount of knowledge. Our colleagues are doing the job that we have asked them to do. And there's another thing that plays an important role is the exchange with civil society. This annual meeting in Warsaw is the largest meeting of all stakeholders in the human dimension, and many participants of civil society participate. So this is an opportunity for dialogue. We have to use it as best we can. Austria has been continuing the practice started by Switzerland of independent commitments in the human dimension. The participation of civil society is a key part of this exercise, and an initial report will be released next week by the European Research Center in Graz as part of a side event at this um, implementation meeting. Finally, I would like to thank Poland for the excellent support for the implementation at this new, uh, for the implementation meeting at this new venue in Warsaw. And I'd like to thank the whole of the ODEA team for the excellent preparation for this meeting. So I wish you, I wish us all fruitful and committed debates in the coming days. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador. Next, we will hear from our new OSCE Secretary General, Ambassador Thomas Greminger. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson, dear Ingeberg, Minister Wasikowski, Secretary General Michael Lienhardt, dear Lamberto, dear Arlem, 
Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, yes, I'm uh, addressing the Human Dimension Implementation Meeting for the first time in my new capacity as OEC Secretary General. It's a great pleasure to be here together with the heads of the other OEC executive structures, all of us jointly representing the new institutional leadership of the OEC, and all of us committed to working together to promote the principles that this organization stands for. As the audio director pointed out, I'm no stranger to Warsaw. I have addressed this meeting on a number of occasions, including as chair of the Human Dimension Committee in 2011 and 12, and as chair of the Permanent Council during the Swiss OEC chairmanship in 2014. HDIM is a unique forum, bringing together national representatives, experts, and members of civil society for an inclusive debate on the state of fundamental freedoms and human rights in our region. With all its ups and downs, its difficult moments and enriching new perspectives, discussion at HDIM has often served as an inspiration to further develop our commitments in the human dimension. Last year, we marked a quarter century of continuous dialogue at HDIM. In an environment characterized by low levels of trust among our participating states, it is essential that we reinforce our dialogue across the whole spectrum of issues that defines the OEC's concept of cooperative security. In the human dimension, this dialogue aims at assessing the activities of the OEC executive structures in supporting the OEC participating states meet the full range of their commitments on human rights, the rule of law, democratic institutions, tolerance, and non-discrimination. And this dialogue obviously also serves to review the human rights situation in OEC participating states. As the biggest European human rights forum of its kind, HDIM provides an open platform where NGOs can hold discussions with government representatives on an equal footing. Our dialogue would lose much of its value and appeal if it was not stimulated by the presence of candid and critical voices from across the OEC area. While some measures have been taken to help ensure that our openness is not misused for other aims, a more restrictive approach that would limit the right of entry to this meeting would be contrary to HDM tradition and run counter to both the spirit and the letter of our OEC commitments. It would also send the wrong signal at a time when quintessentially democratic notions such as open society and pluralism are increasingly coming under attack in parts of the OEC area. The openness of this event also significantly contributes to the OEC's ability to build partnerships with other organizations, generating synergies and enhancing our impact. In this respect, close coordination and cooperation inside the OEC family is an important precondition for building more effective relations with outside partners. Strengthening relationships inside the OEC and with external partners are in fact two sides of the same coin and indisp indispensable for us to effectively carry out our many closely connected mandates. As I said in my inaugural speech to the OEC Permanent Council two weeks ago, we need to update and reinforce our comprehensive approach to security by breaking down the silos that too often separate the three dimensions. Instead of weighing up one against the other, we should seek to strengthen all three. This is also valid when we talk about the budgets of different OEC institutions. And we should develop more genuine cross-cutting and integrated approaches. We also need to reinvigorate the wider debate on how to uphold, protect and promote our commitments in an evolving security environment that is constantly presenting us with new, complex and interconnected challenges. As we step up our efforts to find common ground 
and act jointly on issues ranging from terrorism and violent extremism to climate change, sustainable development and migration. One thing is clear. We must make sure that protecting the dignity of the individual always remains an integral part of our action. I wish you fruitful and constructive discussions during the coming two weeks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Thomas. And now I turn over to my colleague, Ambassador uh, Lamberto Tranier, who took over as OSCE High Commissioner on National Minorities in July. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairperson, uh, the Minister Vashikovsky, uh, Deputy Minister Linhardt, Secretary General Dio Thomas, uh, dear Harlem Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to address this important meeting for the first time in my new capacity as High Commissioner on National Minorities. I relish the opportunities which my new position affords, and I look forward to the best serving the institution's mandate. The themes discussed at the H team are fundamental to the HCNM mandate. The HCNM was established almost 25 years ago as a conflict prevention mechanism mandated to detect tensions related to ethnic relations that could potentially lead to conflict and to provide early warning to the wider OSCE. Our experience has shown that the protection of human rights and minority rights in particular is central to conflict prevention. This understanding is well grounded in the OSCE's comprehensive approach to security. Since its establishment, the focus of the HCNM has gradually moved towards addressing the structural causes of conflict. My predecessors and the teams assisting them have gathered significant experience on how sound policies and legislation can help address the needs of minorities, diffuse tensions, and prevent tension from escalating into full-blown conflicts. And part of this work has been distilled into a series of thematic recommendations and guidelines. Over the years, the main thread of HCNM's work has become the support of policies helping the integration of diverse societies, or in other words, how diversity can be successfully managed in today's societies. Integration of diverse society is viewed by HCNM as key to facilitating security and stability both within and among participating states. And if we think well, after all, all OSCE protracted conflicts have at their origin a failure of integration for various reasons. And this shows why a successful integration policy is a powerful conflict prevention tool. The emphasis on integration derives from the understanding that simply accommodating minority culture, identity, and political interests may not be sufficient to build sustainable and lasting peace nor is the prospect of assimilating minorities into the wider society sufficient to advance and preserve peace, stability, and joint prosperity in our societies. As a result, successive High Commissioners have recommended that states adopt measures and implement policies aiming at promoting the integration and cohesion of diverse societies. The case for integration and sound management of diversity could not be more topical today. And the mandate of the HCNM is thus, I believe, more relevant than ever. The challenges we are currently collectively facing highlight both the need and urgency for sustainable and sustained integration processes within our societies across the whole OSC region. Challenges related to migration, which are dominating today's politi political and policy agenda, are a case in point. The link between migration and the HCNM mandate is manifold. Migratory mo uh, movements may often result in increasing pressure on existing minorities in countries of transit or destination. And also newcomers uh, increase the demand for integration and diversity management, calling on all of us to shape and provide responses in full compliance with our human dimension committees. Responses which could diffuse rather than incite tensions. I'm afraid that on this point, the overall outlook is not very positive. Despite the USC's multiple and articulated commitments in this field, aggressive nationalism and divisive policies of identity seem to be on the rise in many countries. Fear-mongering and targeting otherness are used as conventional tools in the political arena. Hateful rhetorics stigmatizes certain communities, deepens divisions, 
and thus polarizes societies. This topic, and conversely, the merits of policies supporting the integration of diverse societies, will be dealt with in detail during working session 10, co-organized and led by my team and the ODIR. I would also like to emphasize that responses to security threats and other challenges should not lead to worsening relations among communities and to increasing tensions within societies and between participating states. Stigmatizing and isolating specific communities and securitizing minorities' issues is a recipe to widen the distance between ethnic groups and make solutions more difficult to achieve. Ultimately, this will make a society fragile and insecure rather than more secure. On the contrary, policies which are devised to actively involve members of minorities have a greater chance to succeed and be sustainable. This applies also to policies aimed at countering violent extremism. Policies that single out religious or ethnic communities can have a detrimental effect on the relationship between state and society due to lack of trust in the state. A discourse portraying minorities as a security threat and particularly as a group most susceptible to violent extremist ideology, risks giving rise to nationalist sentiments among majority communities and contributes to existing inter-ethnic tensions. The pressure upon national minorities under the pretext of fighting against violent extremism could be counterproductive and actually result in the fueling of the phenomenon rather than preventing it. The agenda for discussions over the next few days embraces a full range of topics under the Human Dimension umbrella. Several of these topics, from fundamental freedoms to equal participation in political and public life and to non-discrimination, conveniently illuminate various aspects of the integration discourse which the ACNM stands for. My team and I look forward to those discussions and to reflecting on their outcome in our work, and I would like to thank you all in advance for your meaningful inputs over the next few days. Finally, a topic of crucial relevance to the ACNM as re as recently focused, uh, on which the ACNM has recently focused is the access to justice. A specific set of recommendations on access to justice and national minorities has been developed and finalized with the concurrence of relevant experts and the input of OSCE institutions and will be presented in coordination with the chairmanship in office later this autumn. I trust that, as previous sets of HCNM recommendations, this will be a valuable tool in strengthening cohesion and justice within societies across the OSCE. I would like to conclude my remarks by thanking you all for your support, and I look forward to working closely with you. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. But now my other counterpart in the OSCE uh, Human Dimension, the OSCE representative on, the free on freedom of the media, Mr. Arlem Desir, who also took on his new appointment in July, will now take the floor. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, dear Ingeborg Gislaudotir, dear Minister Vitol Vashikovsky, dear Deputy Minister Mikhail Linard, dear Secretary General Thomas Greminger, dear High Commissioner Lambert Zanier, dear Madam Vice President uh, Marietta Tidei, dear Ambassadors, dear Representatives of Civil Society, Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor and a pleasure to address this annual meeting for the first time. More than 50 years ago, this organization was the first to create a comprehensive concept of security, bringing in political and military issues together with economic, environmental and human rights issues under the security umbrella. We have, in this organization, established a unique set of strong commitments on freedom of the media and freedom of expression. Twenty years ago, the participating states decided to create the only autonomous intergovernmental media freedom institution to help implement their commitments. Today, we are at the largest human rights conference in our region, where 57 states will engage with civil society in a strong and constructive dialogue. Ladies and gentlemen, we are facing ma major challenges regarding freedom of the media in the OSCE region. Journalists are threatened, imprisoned, accused of treason and terrorism, and even killed because of their work. The OSC region holds a dismal world record of over 170 journalists in jail, most of them in one single country. We see in some states the return to political control of public service broadcasters, 
the economic pressure on independent press, and the risk of new concentration of media ownership and distribution at the detriment of media pluralism. It's a time of paradox. On the one hand, digital media has created new opportunities for freedom of expression and access to information. But on the other hand, at the same time, we have to take all fake news, propaganda and manipulation of information to an unknown scale, and in too many countries, we see attempts to control the internet or to restrict the access to information. We should not accept this, nor should we accept the idea of a permanent divide between the participating states on freedom of the media, because the commitments belong to all of us. We should aim, on the contrary, to build a new consensus on freedom of the media in the coming years, a consensus on freedom of the media in a time with high security challenges. This organization is uniquely equipped to offer a platform for this. A new consensus is not about creating more promises. It is about refusing the notion that freedom of the media is in contradiction to security or in contradiction to the fight against terrorism. They have to go hand in hand. And it is my firm conviction that freedom of the media does not weaken a society, but reinforces its resilience faced with terrorism and security challenges. There can be no strong society with weak media and weak freedom of the media. As we are facing greater security challenges, we must protect even more the freedom of the media as a core element of the strong and democratic societies we want to build and of the cooperative and peaceful region we want to be. Freedom of expression and freedom of the media create the space for open debate by all actors of society. Open debate brings better understanding of viewpoints and objectives. Open debate and the ability to hold the powerful to account improves the quality of government by detecting new questions and issues and addressing them. This makes freedom of the media a cornerstone of democracy and of security. Ladies and gentlemen, we have four major priorities of work ahead of us. The first priority is safety of journalists, as it was for my esteemed predecessor, Dunya Mijatovic. Attacks on journalists are attacks on our own freedom. We have to put an end to impunity of crimes committed against journalists. Impunity is a passport for violence against the press. The second priority is to reconcile freedom of the media and security. We must ensure that anti-terrorism legislation, regulation of the internet and the measure against hate speech are proportionate and designed in conformity with international obligations and that they don't put at stake freedom of expression and freedom of the media as a whole. Here, unfortunately, there is abuse. Too many, media, too many media outlets are closed, banned or blocked, and journalists prosecuted under false accusations while they were just doing their job of informing the public. We need to, to engage with government on how they can best protect freedoms while guaranteeing security. The third priority is to respond to fake news, disinformation and propaganda for war and hate trade. They are dangerous in essence, but they also weaken public trust in the media and often lead to censorship. That's a poison used to combat a poison. We need to combat disinformation without killing information. The best answer to fake news is quality and ethical journalism, self-regulation and media literacy, not censorship. The fourth priority is to preserve and promote pluralism in the digital area. We are confronted with huge concentration of platforms and internet actors. The media landscape is changing very rapidly and profoundly as a result of the digitization of information. We need to ensure that the conditions for pluralism are preserved. Ladies and gentlemen, freedom of the media is both a large aspiration among the citizens of participating states and a fragile reality. It is based on strong commitments in the OSC but it's fragile in the new context. It needs legislation, institution to exist. It needs the protection of the states, but without the states interfering with the content of the media. It is not an easy demand to them, but it is the noble and legal obligation of the state to do so, and it's our duty to call for it. They gave us that very mandate. That's why it's so important to be here 
with you today, and I'm very much looking forward to working with all of you, the representative of the states and of civil society, on all these issues during this meeting and this afternoon's session dedicated to freedom of the media. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Alem. And now let me welcome Ms. Marietti Day, the Vice President of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dear guest, it's a pleasure to be here and to speak on behalf of the Parliamentary Assembly. And now, if you allow me, I will continue in Italian, in my language. Permettetemi, cari amici. Please allow me. Dear friends and dear guests here to thank our hosts, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Vashtikovsky of Poland, and also the uh, Austrian representative of the chairpersonship in office, and also to wish every possible success to Thomas Greminger. All parliamentarians, of course, do want effective work to be done in the interests of the citizens of the 57 member states. We thank all representatives of NGOs, of the media, and of governments who have come together here uh, to talk about fundamental issues uh, concerning the human dimension. This is something that uh, uh, occupies a very central role in the work of our, of us uh, parliamentarians. Uh, this uh, conference uh, is an extremely valuable and important opportunity to exchange views uh, with uh, civil society about uh, some fundamental human dimension issues. Uh, and uh, thank you very much to ODIR for the organization of the meeting. We need, of course, uh, to strengthen democratic institutions. Uh, in all countries, uh, democracy is a journey. It is not uh, an, uh, an arrival point. It is in constant uh, evolution. It must be based uh, on full respect and tolerance. Uh, and I think that um, the work done by the OEC at both the parliamentary and the governmental levels must contribute to, to this. The uh, uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the OSCE has approved the Minsk Resolution on uh, Migration Flows, uh, on uh, uh, protection of the rights of the media, freedom of expression, the protection of individuals, uh, but also to combat uh, capital punishment. But let me dwell for a few minutes on the issue of migration flows, uh, which is a key challenge at the present time. In February 2016, our assembly set up an ad hoc committee that has done some very important work, having visited France, Italy, Turkey, and some other countries. And we have drawn attention not only to the issue of massive arrival of migrants and the importance of hosting them appropriately, but also providing them with appropriate accommodation. And here I would also refer you to a decision taken by the Council of the Europe. Now, in the month of August, the number of arrivals has plummeted by 80% compared to the same period last year. Uh, so some of the measures that have been implemented by the European Union and other institutions are bearing fruit. But I think that uh, we need also to work on uh, controlling migration flows from Niger and Chad. We need to work with the Organization of the African Unity uh, at uh, foreign affairs ministry level. But I think that it should be stressed that thanks to Mara Nostrum, many lives of migrants uh, have been saved. Uh, and that is uh, uh, thanks uh, to substantial efforts uh, made by Italy and uh, the European Union. So the existing policies uh, are showing themselves to be effective. But we cannot close our eyes to the conditions in which uh, migrants, potential migrants, uh, are living in Libya, for instance. Uh, the dignity of every individual human being must be seen as an important issue for all of us. Uh, climate change, uh, poverty are causing 
uh, some tens of millions of uh, persons to be inspired to uh, migrate. Uh, it is uh, considered that by 2050, some 200 million people may be displaced because of climate change. And uh, very often, migrants are subject to discrimination. They are subject to gross violations of human rights by uh, traffickers. And that is particularly true of uh, children and women. The um, ILO has uh, referred to uh, more than a possibility of more than 20 million women and children being essentially sold into slavery. This requires some very resolute action by the international community. We need to manage in a rational manner these issues. Everyone must play his or her role in this regard. We cannot just uh, rely on others. And uh, the OSCE uh, can play a fundamental role uh, in terms of awareness raising. That is a fundamental issue. We must uh, raise the awareness of those who are to take uh, uh, decisions uh, today. And I think that our member states need to come together to work on migration issues, not only to receive persons who are fleeing war, but also to make sure that these individuals can become fully fledged members of our communities with rights and obligations. Insofar as discrimination and intolerance are concerned, that keeps uh, coming back uh, to the fore, we are seeing a growth in racism, xenophobism, uh, anti-Semitism, um, and uh, anti-LGBTism, uh, and discrimination on the basis of religion. The Parliamentary Assembly of the OSCE has been very clear on this, has called for more awareness. Uh, now, just a few ideas in closing. The first one has to do with capital punishment. Uh, we are to this year celebrating the 10th anniversary of the moratorium uh, of, uh, on uh, capital punishment decided uh, by the General Assembly of Legislation. So that was uh, uh, a major uh, victory. And yet uh, there is a growing number of uh, executions. Uh, in Minsk, we approved a very clear resolution in this regard. I know that in this very room, uh, there will be, over the next few days, a number of defenders of human rights. Uh, next year, we will be celebrating the 20th anniversary of the UN, uh, uh, Declaration on Human Rights Defenders. And I think that uh, we must uh, promote the protection of all human rights. Uh, the OSCE uh, has uh, uh, set out a number of uh, standards uh, to be respected by uh, member states, uh, but also uh, are expected of third parties as well. And just uh, one last comment, if I may, concerning a dialogue in the area of human rights. The OSCE Parliamentary Assembly is very committed to public initiatives in this regard. It holds the human rights a dear. Uh, and in exchanges uh, with the United Kingdom, Turkey, the Russian Federation, Kazakhstan, and many others, uh, we discuss these issues. And I must say that I'm very pleased uh, that there is this close cooperation between the assembly uh, and uh, observation of elections. That's very important to, to ensure uh, transparency, respect for democratic pluralism, and uh, reliability of all electoral processes. In closing, I wish you an excellent uh, conference, and I'm sure that our dialogue here will uh, strengthen our cohesion and will be a good point uh, uh, of departure for the uh, implementation of new OSCE commitments. Ladies and gentlemen, as I've already mentioned, uh, this is my first Human Dimension implementation meeting as OTIR di director. Let me assure you that I'm grateful for the trust that the OSCE participating states have put in me with this appointment and that I am honored to be able to work with such a dedicated and passionate team of almost 180 <coughs> human rights professionals. 
at work for Odir. While I still am in the process of learning about the intricacies of the OSCE, I can assure you that I'm not an, a newcomer to the world of human rights because I've worked in policy, human rights, and development for over 35 years, and I have been able to closely follow the trends and debates in this field over the last decades. One phenomenon that I have observed in recent years that I would like to share my observations on is the trend of making hate mainstream. Hate crimes are certainly not new, uh, a new phenomenon. OSCE participating states have repeatedly condemned hate crimes and pledged to take action against them. As a matter of fact, they expressed, they expressed concerns about uh, crimes based on prejudice, discrimination, hostility, or hatred as early as 1991. Although the term hate crime did not appear in OSCE commitments until the Maastricht Ministerial Council meeting of 2003, ODIR has a long history of dealing with the issue, reporting on hate crimes for over a decade, most recently through our innovative and state-of-the-art hate crime reporting website. While regrettably hate speech regularly occurs when different entity, identities exist, be that cultural or ethnic identities, gender identities or class identities, this fact that we are confronted with otherness shouldn't mean that these need to be class, need to class. Here, education is of vital importance. Trying to learn from the others and trying to understand them. Hate speech should not and cannot be banned through legislation but must be countered through arguments and leadership messages. And it is here where I see a dangerous trend. In recent years, throughout the OSCE region, we have experienced that the rhetoric of exclusion and of hatred is becoming more and more present in the speeches of political leaders. During campaigns, but also when elected, Many leaders shamelessly try to capitalize from using a divisive and aggressive language, thereby tactically communicating to society that this is deemed acceptable and will even be rewarded. Hate crimes are message crime. They are meant to send the message that your kind is not wanted here. If left unchecked, they can lead to wider conflict and undermine the security of societies. These heinous crimes impact not only individuals, but whole communities. Instead of inciting hatred and dividing societies, it is the state's prim primary responsibilities not only to protect the victims and their communities, but to ensure that hate is not allowed to take root. Whether you call this phenomenon authoritarian populism or use the old-fashioned concept of demagogy, elected, elected leaders employing hate speech work with the premise that, once elected, they can do whatever they want. This is, of course, a false assumption. We should not fall for the fallacy of equating the equality of, uh, the equality of democracy with majority rule. Democracy is, with the words of Amartya Sen, not just, and I quote, mechanical condition taken in isolation, and I unquote. It is not just the mere act of putting a ballot paper into a box. It is, and I quote again, a complex system inherently connected with complex demands, which certainly include voting and respect for election results, certainly, but it also requires the protection of liberties and freedoms, respect for legal entitlements, and the guaranteeing of free discussion and uncensored distribution of news and fair comment, and I unquote. Democracy is not a zero-sum game where the winner takes it all. It's a complex and demanding system, but above all, it is a universal value. The quality of democracy and its security depend on how the majority protects and promotes 
the rights and interests of its minorities. This universal value and this culture of democracy needs to be upheld through all of us by living up to its standards, by keeping governments accountable, by safeguarding minority rights, by fostering a culture of dialogue, and by protecting freedom of speech, although we don't necessarily like the speech we are hearing. This brings me back to the Human Dimension Implementation Meeting. HDIM is a unique forum of debate. Since 1993, HDIM has served as a platform for participating states and OSCE executive structures to meet, take stock of developments, and exchange ideas with both civil society and other international organizations. It was founded under the premise that openness and freedom make societies more resilient and more stable in the long run, and that societies ensuring an open exchange of ideas enjoy greater legitimacy and prosperity. As you all know, this notion is the heart of the OSCE, the comprehensive concept of security. And it is not only firmly grounded in universal human rights, but also has been signed and confirmed by all our participating states on numerous occasions. Ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to take part in the discussions here for the next two weeks. These debates will not always be pleasant for everyone, but I trust that we will all live up to the spirit of an open, transparent and constructive dialogue, as we have done for the last 20 years. I declare this HDIM meeting open. And now I think we have a short technical uh, break, but I, I think uh, people... Oh, we go straight. <laughs> we don't have a technical break. <laughs> we go straight to the uh, pan uh, panel discussion. Uh, we have a high-level panel on key issues that threaten the human dimension in the OSCE region, and how should the OSCE uh, respond? I would like to introduce the moderator, Ms. Annabel Chapman, a Warsaw-based journalist writing for The Economist and other international publications. She has reported widely from Central and Eastern Europe and has been awarded prizes for her writing. Ms. Chapman will now take over and introduce the panel. Hello. I would like to begin by introducing our speakers today. We have three speakers. Two of them are here. And the first speaker is uh, Mrs. Ludmila Alexeyeva, chairperson of the Moscow Helsinki Group, a prominent Russian human rights defender, who is going to join us now through a vis video statement in Russian. <laughs> This was unusual. This was the first agreement between states whose observance was required not only by uh, state, but also by uh, citizens. And what did it lead to? It led to the text of these agreements being binding meaning that uh, the observance of human rights was essential. Mm -hmm. 
прав человека в этих странах были бы пьющими. Первая такая гражданская организация появилась в СССР. Это наша международная хельсинская группа. Ее основатель и первый э, председатель Юрий Федор Чернов задумал и создал эту группу на основе гуманитарных статей Хельсинских соглашений. Потому что э, Хельсинские соглашения, Советский Союз должен был выполнять. Э, за этим внимательно следили демократические страны, подписавшие договор. Конечно, советские руководители надеялись и не без оснований, что если они не будут выполнять только гуманитарные статьи этих соглашений, то демок... власти демократических стран подписавшие их, закроют глаза на это невыполнение. Ну, если в Советском Союзе выпустят самых известных, скажем, отказников, еврейских активистов, добивавшихся выезда в Израиль. МХГ поставила перед собой задачу добиться выполнения Хельсинских соглашений в полном объеме, включая гуманитарные статьи. Об этом говорило само название, официальное название Московской Хельсинской группы. Официально она называлась «Общественная группа содействия выполнению Хельсинских соглашений в Советском Союзе». Как мы этому содействовали? Мы отслеживали факты невыполнения именно гуманитарных обязательств по Хельсинским соглашениям на всей территории СССР. И сообщали об этом, об этих нарушениях правительствам всех стран, подписавших Хельсинские соглашения. Эта задача, казалось бы, была невыполнимой для такой маленькой организации, какой была наша Хельсинская группа. Страна это огромная, но нам стали присылать необходимую информацию самые разные организации, религиозные, национальные, разные, и отдельные граждане, которые знали об этих нарушениях, и мы получали такую информацию со всех концов нашей страны. Идея опоры на гуманитарные статьи Хельсинских соглашений оказалась очень плодотворной. Прежде всего в СССР, и где сразу возникли по образцу Московской Хельсинской группы такие же Хельсинской группы в четырех республиках СССР. В, Укра... в Украине, в Литве, в Грузии и в Армении. Затем стали возникать э, такие же хельсинские группы в странах-сателлитах Советского Союза. А затем и в демократических странах, подписавших хельсинские соглашения, Первая такая организация возникла в Норвегии, потом в Соединенных Штатах, в Нидерландах, в Канаде, в разных, во многих странах. Эти вот хельсинские группы в демократических странах 
стали своей основной целью поддержку хельсинской групп в СССР и от зависимых от него стран, потому что там эти группы их членов преследовали. Таким образом возникло международное хельсинское движение, и этому движению, возникновению его, дали толчок именно гуманитарные статьи хельсинских соглашений. Развившись, это международное хельсинское движение очень расширило рамки защиты прав человека и влияние, известность, популярность правозащитников во всех странах. Сделал уважение прав граждан обязательным для правительства демократических стран, для тех стран, которые стремятся стать демократическими, и даже вынудило правительство тех стран, которые только хотят, чтобы считали демократическими, делать вид, что они уважают права человека и публично заявлять о важности прав человека и об своем уважении к ним. Таким образом, Хельсинские соглашения содействовали развитию, ну, развитию правозащитного движения во всех странах. But the uh, interpreter said that the quality of the sound was so poor that they had uh, problems in understanding what she was saying and could therefore not uh, uh, translate this. I don't know if the, with the, if the facilitator could uh, maybe in, in few words uh, tell us what uh, the message that she was uh, conveying in this uh, video. But uh, that is the best we can do as of now, since they didn't fully uh, understand, obviously, the, uh, what, <coughs> what she was saying. But the Russian Federation has asked for to make an uh, intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, I mean, we, in the... Um, break, uh, of course, I'll uh, step forward and uh, meet you personally. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, that Anna uh, Malikseyevna, in the name of the human rights uh, defense community of the uh, Russian Federation, has uh, made uh, this uh, statement about uh, some of the issues uh, that uh, we have to deal with here in the course of this uh, conference. But I'm, it's not quite uh, clear to me what the thrust of our panel discussion here is. Uh, I mean, we have uh, hundreds of uh, specialists uh, working on uh, human rights uh, defense. I mean, I don't know if it's uh, 800 or 1,000 of them. Uh, we can share our experience. It's not uh, really uh, quite uh, clear how we're going to be proceeding. I mean, we have come together to uh, discuss uh, certain issues uh, and to present uh, the statements of uh, member states about what is happening within our area. So it's, uh, the way it's organized is not clear to me. I, I think I pass the floor now to the uh, moderator and if, if she could give us uh, the flavor of what uh, uh, was uh, the message that was conveyed in this uh, uh, video. Thank you. Um, so thank you also to Mrs. Alexeyeva in Moscow for this um, interesting start to the to the panel. Um, I think that we are going to explore these issues now in, in more detail during the high-level panel. And um, I'm going to begin now by introducing our two panelists here. We have um, Mrs. Claudia Luciani, the Director of Democratic Governance at the Director General of Democracy at the Council of Europe. And we have Mr. Jonathan Cohen, who is Executive Director of Conciliation Resources, a peace-building NGO who previously worked with the OSCE High Commissioner on National Minorities. And um, I'm looking forward to exploring um, 
the key issues that threaten the human dimension in the OSCE area in, in this um, high-level panel. So I'd like to begin by asking, um, it has recently been said that winter is coming in human rights and democracy in, um, in around the world. To what extent would you say that this is the case in the OSCE area, um, Mrs. Luciani? Thank you and, and good morning everybody. I'm not a... Can you hear me? Is that okay? Yes? Okay. Um, you're asking me if winter is coming. Mm -hmm. I'm not a meteorologist and I'm not into the Game of Thrones, which I think is where this um, phrase is taken from. Uh, but we can certainly observe that uh, this is not the first time this question has been asked. It was asked of the democracies in the 30s. It was asked of the democracies in uh, the 70s. There was a famous trilateral commission whose title is very similar, Democracies in Crisis. And it has been argued that by Larry Diamond, notably, that we are experiencing a mild recession when it comes to democracy. Now, is this true? Uh, at the Council of Europe, we have uh, an annual state of human rights, the rule of law, and democracy, a report that tries to tell us where we are, what is the state of implementation. Certainly what we see is that uh, there is a worsening of the protection of key freedoms, notably freedom of expression, it has been said before, um, freedom of association and uh, of fundamental democratic standards such as the principle of separation of powers um, there is an abuse of the famous majority rule and uh, there is a questioning of the primacy of international law over national law. So all these are um, monitored um, trends that do worry us. However, um, it is also true that the uh, elites, the governance are challenged about how they deliver on these standards. Uh, it's also true that there is an unusual challenge in nature in the problems that they face, um, which probably explains why there is so much dissatisfaction among citizens about the, uh, how governments are handling these challenges. So we can also ask our question, the question of how democracies can adapt to these challenges mm -hmm. without losing the protection and the freedoms that we are so deeply attached to. Um, so I think this question needs for further expla exploration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cohen, is winter coming? Well, I'd, I'd very much agree with much of what Claudia said, and I think we need to be very careful not to succumb to scaremongering. I mean, the, there's no question that we're operating in a rather unpredictable period and there are challenges to human rights and democratic standards that perhaps you haven't experienced in, in, a, in a generation. But I'd, I'd rather not talk about winter coming or not. Um, I think we need to unpack what some of these critical challenges are in order to have strategies to go forward. And I'd like to just perhaps touch on three, some of which have already come up in the opening statements that I think are really important for us to reflect on. Given that this is the Human Dimension Implementation Meeting, I think the first question that will undoubtedly be discussed over the next fortnight here is the degree to which the values that underpin the human, right, human dimension continue to be shared. Um, and I ask this on two levels. I think there's a question about the degree to which uh, this is the case between different states, member states of the OSCE, but I think it's also a question about the relationships between citizens and their states throughout the OSCE mm -hmm. region. And I think values are indeed under threat, and they are contested in a way that we've not experienced for a long time. There's a degree of alienation in societies that is becoming much more apparent. And so the question that needs to be explored is how can you reconstitute a shared space that will permit the necessary dialogue to reinvigorate not just institutions, but the ideas that underpin those institutions. And I think it takes us back to the Helsinki principles themselves, recognizing that as significant an achievement as the Helsinki Decalogue were back in 75, they contained contradictions that were never fully worked through and continue to define much of the uh, contestation that we see 
in the OSCE, OSCE region to this day. And I think today the dilemma in this is there's a tendency away from cooperation as a way to address these challenges and towards deterrence and securitization mm -hmm. as a way to address challenges. So I think the second big issue for me is the danger of an increasingly securitized responses to the problems we see. I think there's a, there's a nice adage that if the tool you've got in your hand is a hammer, every problem seems to be a nail. And I think at the moment, governments seem to be veering in the direction that if your first inclination to address problems is through a securitized response, then every problem seems to be one about security. And I think there's a tendency to move away from recognizing that there are an awful lot of other ways and that we have to emphasize the debate around the human dimension. And that's why ODIHR and, and a gathering like this is fundamental to reinvigorate the discussion. And I think related to this is a point that again was brought out in the uh, opening statements around uh, the rise of xen xenophobia, racism, mm -hmm. and isolationism in particular. And recognizing that these are, these are expressions of frustration within society. They're not solution to the, solutions to the challenges that societies face around economic insecurity, around refugee flows and migration. And so I think it, it takes me back to the point that instead of giving oxygen to populism, we need to actually be more rigorous in our analysis of problems and more open in our debate about them. And then perhaps finally, we also need to remember that fundamentally securing respect for human rights is a continuous process. And it's never been easy. So to succumb to the idea that we're in a winter is to actually ignore the fact that human rights have, have historically been, a, it's been a struggle to achieve human rights. And we shouldn't think that that struggle is over. Thank you. Ms. Lutiani, you mentioned that democracies will need to adapt to these new times. Could you tell us a bit more by what you mean? Is there a crisis of democracy in the world right now? I don't think there's a crisis. There is certain something that I detect as positive is a hunger for democracy. To express themselves in ways that are unprecedented. They can because of the internet and they want to, which is great. Which is something that, of course, we all um, think is going to consolidate democracy. The problem is that they don't see how, they don't see the spaces. And in some cases they contest the very nature of democracy, of representative democracy, that has been the legacy of uh, the uh, industrial revolution. We have been living with this kind of democracy for many, many years. So uh, there are voices calling for additional ways, different kinds of democratic expression. Of course, uh, in addition to complement representative democracy, entire party structures, movements in some of our member states are based on this idea that it's time to move away from representative democracy and go, for instance, to direct or participatory democracy. Now, whilst this is all very new and therefore uh, difficult to assess, um, not responding to these questions will only fuel populists that are going to say that the people want it this way and therefore, and here's the problem, and therefore will use um, non-democratic ways to give responses to very pertinent questions. So yes, the, uh, I don't think it is a crisis, but there is certain a hunger for more, uh, for more democracy, wh which needs mm -hmm. to be addressed by states and by international organizations as well. Do you see this hunger for democracy as well, Mr. Cohen? Oh, undoubtedly, but I think we've also got to take a step back and, and, and look at what's happening in, in our continent at the moment. And I was very struck when I read the most recent Nations in Transitions study, in which it very starkly demonstrates that the entire OSCE region is challenged by a trend away from democracy, away from the rule of law and fundamental freedoms. Uh, and I think this is true in the east-west parts of the OSCE. Um, the, the, the 2017 report of Nations in Transit stated that more than half of the 29 countries in the report had declined in their democracy scores. And this is the second biggest decline it's observed in the survey's uh, almost 30-year history, um, greater than any other point other than a drop following the 2008 global financial crisis. And I think we're still living in the wake of that global financial crisis and the impact it's had 
on democracy. And, and we have to ask questions, as, as Claudia, I think, rightly has, about the way in which populist leaders have attacked constitutional courts, undermined the checks and balances, and have, have turned to, to public media as a propaganda weapon. And I think the very fact that some of the most significant democracies in the region have started to be less uh, explicit exponents of human rights, the defense of human rights and the promotion of democracy demonstrates a degree of backsliding that will only be mirrored throughout the region. So I think there are concerns that we, we, and we, we, more than anything, we cannot afford to be complacent about what's happening at the present time. Earlier on, you mentioned alienation of citizens within, the, within democracies in the region. Could you explain what you mean by alienation and maybe talk a bit more about the relationship between citizens and democracies? Well, I think the, the, we live in increasingly complex societies, both from the sense of how economic life operates and how governance operates. And people feel, on the one hand, great opportunities to participate with internet and light, but on the other hand, quite detached from governmental processes that often become shrouded in, in bureaucratic practice and political intrigue. Um, for me, I think a critical factor to recognize is that in the past decade, and increasingly in the last couple of years, we've, seen, we've been observing an unprecedented assault on what you might call the civil society space. Mm -hmm. Um, we see growing restrictions on freedom of association, assembly, expression. We see crackdown on civil society organizations and human rights defenders. We see increasing challenges for the funding of these organizations. As someone who works, uh, runs an NGO, I'm conscious that the way we are audited is much more rigorous than the way most private companies are audited. I've got no problem with us being audited rigorously, but I think in many contexts this is very clearly used as a, a method to reduce the independence of civil society actors and clamp down on this space. And I think fundamentally we need to get back to the notion that civil society plays a role in partnership with states to hold states to account. And, and civil society organizations, not just NGOs, but uh, academic institutions, religious, voluntary organizations, all sorts of uh, unions and, and the like, play a very important role as, as a conduit for conversations between the state and society and for holding states accountable. And with this being challenged, it diminishes accountability. And ultimately, the democracies represented by the states around this, this table, are, they are their citizens. It's the value of citizens that determine, the, the, the value that is placed on citizens' right to engage with the state that determines the quality of democracy. And if that space is diminished, it undermines and curtails democracies. And, and this is undoubtedly a matter of, of great concern. And so if we ask what do we have to do to build the trust between states and societies, the impetus has to come from states in that governments have to trust and respect their citizens because citizens can demand this, they can work towards it, but states tend to have the levers of power in their hand. And if they don't uh, allow their citizens to demand accountability of them, they're heading down a, a very slippery, slippery path. And I think the role of international solidarity, the role of conversations such as this, that can raise issues and can demonstrate that this is a of collective concern, hugely important. Uh, Mrs. Luciani, what can be done to strengthen citizens' trust in democracy in the OSCE area? Many things, uh, starting from, as Jonathan was saying, respecting fundamental rights. For me, this is the absolute uh, fundamental point. Uh, freedom uh, of expression, freedom of association, are the absolutely basics for uh, citizens to feel respected and they allow the, ex the mere exercise of democracy. Without these two fundamental freedoms, there can be no democracy. But of course, what needs to also uh, be shown uh, more vigorously is more accountability by leaders, more transparency, uh, in improve the governance, as we say, of how states and democracy, uh, how states' governments deliver uh, for their citizens, uh, ensure checks and balances, mm -hmm. and make sure citizens are very sensitive to the fact that there is a respect of the roles of the 
different branches of power, that judges are independent, don't take orders or phone calls from the executive, and that parliaments are true parliaments. So the, um, the governance and the functioning of democratic <coughs> institutions is critical, and the way in which they function uh, needs, to be, uh, needs to be improved. Um, of course, uh, the, uh, the pressure uh, on uh, elections as well is another way of seeing, you know, making sure that free and fair election pro processes are respected is another way, very concrete way for citizens to uh, understand that democracy is, is, is alive. Um, and the uh, maintaining a healthy and genuine debate in the media, which has become extremely difficult, it has been said before, uh, with legacy media and new media competing for space and money, uh, the quality of debates and the use of fundamental rules of contradictory, for instance, the media tend to be forgotten. So um, it, uh, all these are elements that are likely to increase or decrease the trust of citizens in democratic institutions. So there is a plenty of work to be done mm -hmm. by states. Um, and this work needs, uh, needs urgent attention, because otherwise, indeed, <coughs> populism uh, will have a very fertile ground to propose solutions that are not going to be respectful of the fundamental standards. Mr. Cohen, I'd like to ask you a bit more broadly to talk about conflict and how it can be prevented. What can be done to reduce the risk of conflict in the OSCE area? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there are a couple of questions to explore here. One is that it's not just about preventing conflict, fundamental as that is. We have to accept that, sadly, there are conflicts, currently existing violent conflicts in the OSCE region, and those need to be addressed as well. Um, the OSC undoubtedly has a great heritage in conflict prevention work, and we heard the present High Commission on National Minorities describe the institution as a, having been established as an early warning mechanism, as a mechanism for preventive diplomacy and conflict prevention. I was very fortunate to work for the first High Commissioner on National Minorities, Max van der Stoel, and I think he set the benchmark for how quiet diplomacy can operate and the way in which the patient and persistent diplomatic endeavor can make a huge contribution to creating confidence between conflicting parties and try and avert violence. And we know very clearly that there's a that violence is around politics and it's it the, the there's a tremendous need to recognize that you have to reduce the risk of violence and that by preventing the, the spilling of blood, you actually make it much easier to resolve conflicts. Once they have turned violent, it becomes a whole different ball game. And so I think the critical urgency for the OSC is to ensure that it has its finger on the pulse of p potential conflicts. And that means there's a need for analysis, there's a need for understanding grievances and root causes. There's a need for working with the communities that are, are at threat. It's not just about external actors coming in and doing analysis and coming to international fora like this. It's about giving voice to the people who are most affected themselves and who are often least well resourced to articulate their understanding of, of what is causing violence in their communities. So creating communication and opportunities for dialogue between communities and local, national, and regional governmental bodies is, I think, a fundamental component of conflict prevention, and, and doing that with a recognition of, of the standards and rights that have to be um, adhered to. At the present time, I think we face a danger that there is often uh, a tendency for states to focus on territory more than on people. I think there's a tendency to not think of, not address these issues with the generosity of spirit as to what is it that the people need in order to feel comfortable? What is it that groups that feel threatened need in order to feel comfortable within states? And, and to really give them opportunities to articulate this and not be dictated to. Um, I also think that there's a, a real challenge around understanding what compromises mean. I think all too often the notion of compromise has become almost a dirty word. It's, it's as if compromise 
is seen a, the, the, if a party in a conflict were to compromise on its ideals, it would be perceived as betraying some kind of uh, national myth. And I think it's really dangerous to allow that to perpetuate. Compromise is an integral part in social political life at community level, it's a political level. It's about finding agreements as to how people and communities and states with different perspectives can work together and can ideally create uh, mutually advantageous outcomes, not outcomes that are preferential or benefit one or other party. So if there is a failure to engage with communities that are isolated, that will not facilitate the resolution of conflicts. If there is a tendency to treat communities that have an attitude that doesn't conform to uh, the norm of the state as in a marginalized way or, or, or to delegitimize them or not engage with them as a relevant stakeholder, that will only consolidate and deepen conflict. And so it's really important that if states are confronted by constituencies that don't feel happy with how they operate, the states do not treat those constituencies as groups to be marginalized and isolated, but actually find ways to reach out to them and make the case better. And I think it's incumbent upon states to think about that. Um, I'd say that re resolving conflicts, preventing conflicts in advance, requires significant investment in processes. And it requires a willingness to commit in patient and persistent ways to long-term processes of change and recognize that this is the work of multiple actors. It's not just for states to do this. I think societies play integral roles. Civil society actors often play very creative roles and are able to build relationships where states fear to tread. And I think that has to be invested in and nurtured and supported. Um, and I think it's about having difficult conversations, which after all is what the OSCE, its predecessor, the, the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, that's what it is about. It's about having a platform where difficult conversations can be had in a respectful environment. So I think there are some technical things that need to be done to ensure that conflict prevention is consolidated in the OSC region. Uh, the efforts to mediate between conflicting parties need to be strengthened. There needs to be greater prof professionalization, both on the part of mediators, but also when there are monitoring missions deployed, it's crucially important that people who take part as monitors are, are better trained. I think it's hugely important that um, there are uh, measures taken to deal with the legacies of past violations of human rights and the legacies of, of past conflicts, because what we know from most conflicts around the world is they don't erupt out of thin air. They're built upon previous generations of, of failed initiatives to resolve conflicts. Um, and I think it, it's crucial that we also recognize that there are wider international debates that can inform what has to happen in the OSCE. So take two very important UN resolutions, one from 17 years ago and one from two years ago. The, the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security and uh, Resolution 2250 on Youth, Peace and Security set very important benchmarks and the OSCE uh, has in many ways been a played path-breaking role in trying to ensure that, that women, peace and security and, and gender equality and peace processes is, 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 here, is adhered to. And I think the same has to be the case with, with youth, peace and security, which is currently on the agenda. I'd also like to raise one other area that I think is crucially important in terms of preventing conflict. And that's around a very difficult incentive issue, uh, a sensitive issue around the democratic control of armed forces. And I think that despite clear and long-standing commitments to legislate, uh, to legislative control over defense and security sectors, the OSC members still have a way to go to, in defense and security transparency. Um, I think there are issues around uh, good governance of armed forces. I think there is a resistance to greater transparency and le legislative control amongst parliaments. There are issues around procurement. There are issues around the, the sales of weapons to states with, with known track records for abusing human rights. 
largely outside the OSCE, but this cannot but have an impact on attitudes towards the integrity of human rights within the OSCE. So I think much more effort needs to be put into the democratic control of armed forces as one component of ensuring that conflicts are prevented. Thank you. What you have just said has really emphasized the human dimension within conflicts, which are to some extent inevitable. And um, I'd like to ask um, you to talk about uh, human rights a bit more, Mr. Luciani. Do you see this um, sort of counter-narrative going against human rights at the moment, presenting them as something against the people? What is the way to, um, to counter that narrative? Well, I think there are two. Uh, one is certainly uh, emphasizing the importance of, of human rights, um, and that is the role somehow that uh, comes upon organizations such as the OEC, the Council mm -hmm. of Europe, and the UN. But of course, uh, we see that uh, sometimes uh, important uh, landmark, for instance, uh, judgments of the Court of Human Rights can do that uh, because they citizens all of a sudden realize that human rights are worth protecting and uh, important judgments in the past for instance on importance of uh, um, of uh, protecting uh, the confidentiality of sources for journalists for instance that have made it clear to citizens that that rhetoric was not acceptable so it's a combination of important um, judgments important acts that have uh, as an aim to protect human rights and um, I'm afraid, a long struggle to improve and enhance media literacy and critical thinking. Uh, we see all too often that uh, the ability of uh, citizens to, uh, to understand and to, um, to judge, uh, whether it's news or facts uh, that they're presented with, um, is very dependent on their ability to have a critical independent thinking. So that is a, a very, very important uh, job that is, uh, is not only a comment on, of course, uh, the states, internationalizations, but of course the whole national institutions that need to encourage that a lot more. So it's a combination, how to counter that narrative, is a combination of important positions taken mm -hmm. that are very, very uh, clear and all of a sudden uh, crystallize uh, attitudes about human rights and the ability of citizens to to critically uh, judge uh, information which, of course, we consider populist, such as that human rights are against the people. Um, I'm afraid, we are afraid, we see that with the passing of time, um, so many years, decades after the war, this is more difficult to do. Because um, whilst it was easy to say before uh, that these institutions were all founded after um, the massacre, and, and the absolute annihilation of, of human rights that, uh, that happened during World War II, this, I'm afraid, doesn't work anymore. Yeah. So the, the counter narratives and narratives need to be strengthened. Um, and the citizens um, need to really understand for themselves what defense of human rights means uh, for, uh, for their well being. Well, meanwhile, we see an increase in hate speech and intolerant discourse in the media and by some politicians in many countries. Uh, Mr. Cohen, would you like to elaborate on this point, on, on the narratives that we have in our public space at the moment? Well, I think we heard an excellent uh, intervention from uh, the representative for free media a around the, the dilemma of hate speech. And I think there's a tendency to think that the internet is at the heart of the problem here. And I, I think that uh, it's dangerous to blame it on the internet. There's no question that the internet it presents a, a challenge, but the, the real issue is not that there is a proliferation of information out there and that people can use uh, the internet and social media uh, in, in, in different ways. The, the real challenge, I think, is that politicians and, and public debate uh, are permeated by xenophobic, racist, isolationist attitudes. And in all too many countries, we see political leaders using very reductive language, using social media to make statements that simplify rather than try and help us understand the complex issues and processes that are experienced. Um, hate speech is something that both divides and unites. And I think it's really important to, uh, as Claudia said, to look at the legal framework of how you can ensure that you have appropriate legal steps, but legal steps that recognize that freedom of speech must not be jeopardized 
by hate speech. There's an issue about what's illegal and what's inconvenient. And I think it's important that the legislation focuses on what's illegal and doesn't reduce the parameters for freedom of speech. And, and perhaps most critically, there's an urgency to redouble efforts around awareness in this regard. And we have to recognize that uh, many of us around the room here will be parents and we have uh, children who are more literate with social media than we are. And the social media has become an integral part of the lives of young people. And there is an extraordinary range of stigmatizing and bullying on the internet. And if that is mirrored in the way in which officials and, and politicians communicate, it will only exacerbate the problem. So I think it, th th this is an issue where there, there are courageous voices in society that have to speak out about this, but they need political leaders who are not going to be, re reduce their discourse to the gutter. So there's a, a lot of... Would, would you like to yes, follow up? Yes, I think hate speech, I want to say that it was mentioned before by um, also the director of Odir. It is a very worrying phenomenon. Uh, we are able to, uh, to see that it is on the rise. And it takes proportions that are indeed uh, very worrying. So I just want to confirm that mm -hmm. we have a commission, a European Commission against uh, Racism and Intolerance, that, has, that goes around all our member states and does, um, uh, does find uh, hate speech on the rise. Now, it also finds that most countries have legislation mm -hmm. that, it, that addresses hate speech appropriately, so using it as aggravating circumstances. Um, but legislation alone will not, will not be enough. So what uh, ECRI recommends uh, as being more effective is uh, self-regulation. Uh, that of course should uh, should be adopted by both public and private institutions, media and internet industry. Um, also, what of course needs to be encouraged is counter speak by public public features uh, that must clearly identify or declare the falsity of foundations of hate speech and its unacceptability. So these are important points: the falsity of the foundation and how hate speech is unacceptable. Uh, but of course, the legal provisions, uh, wise, as I said, they exist and most member states are well equipped, are not applied also often because uh, prosecutors, judges are not sufficiently aware of them. So there is a whole lot of work that uh, can be done to ensure that uh, the justice system is actually more familiar with that. But it remains one of the priorities of the Council of Europe to fight against hate speech because of its uh, consequences uh, of on the uh, on the incitement to, to violent and violent acts that is often just a step away from from hate speech. But Mrs. Luciani, you mentioned all these things that should be done by different states and so on. But would you agree that there's often an implementation gap between what states talk about human rights and democracy and so on, and then actually implementing them? What can be done to reduce this gap in implementation? This is one of the war most worrying features um, that, that, of course, we have. We see that our member states often are um, again equipped with uh, very sophisticated and very appropriate legislation, but the implementation gap uh, persists. Uh, now, of course, there is um, an important responsibility with, uh, the, uh, with the different levels of uh, uh, government that uh, are in, uh, in place. Often um, there may be a question of ensuring that implementation is, um, is actually done at the right level of governance, that you have the right institutions uh, that are in charge of implementing particular measures. So you could argue sometimes that implementation is not happening because the right uh, institutions are not involved in implementation. Uh, but of course, another important part, so there is a stress that needs to, uh, to be kept on the importance of, uh, of trickling down of, of authority at different levels. Uh, but of course, another important part of implementation gap is ensuring that you have sufficient pressure from the citizens, from civil society, free media again, I cannot repeat it enough, is fundamental in that. All these uh, parts of society are very important in order to pressure uh, the authorities in implementing international and national standards. Um, we, uh, 
at the Council of Europe, we see sometimes that implementation gaps can be reduced, uh, for instance, by using peer pressure, by doing peer, what we call peer reviews. Um, that's when the implementation gap is due to um, not political will, but lack of expertise or um, wanting to have more strength using the international peers as uh, help in, uh, in implementing uh, measures. Uh, so a whole number of, of, uh, of um, a whole arsenal can be used to help implementation gap, but of course if political will is not there to do it, then this becomes uh, very difficult too. Indeed. Um, Mr. Cohen, earlier on you mentioned the securitization of politics. What can be done to protect the human dimension within this trend? Well, I mean, perhaps point building on what Claudia has just said, I, I think that if we feel there's an implementation gap, we've also got to remember what the human dimension is and ask the OSC states who participate in promoting and protecting the human dimension whether their behavior actually sometimes undermines the mechanisms mm -hmm. that, that constitute the human dimension. And I think there is an apparent increase in pressure, both in Vienna and through uh, field operations, on those actors within the OSC that are trying to support the implementation of com commitments or that are trying to hold governments to account. So there, there's there's needs to be scrutiny of the way in which missions work, but there is a greater desire for approval of the way in which missions work. I think there is a, a great, more and more challenge against the mandates of autonomous institutions of, of the OSC, and, and I think there are attempts to re re restrict and reduce budgets. And so when that comes from the heart of the institution, it's undoubted that mm -hmm. that will impact upon the way the OSC is able to address these issues, and cascades through the way the, the whole system works. And, and the member states around the table today are representatives of their states. And so these are uh, processes that come from capitals and, and, and need challenging. Could, could you just add very briefly what this means in the struggle against terrorism at the moment? So in regard to terrorism, I think this is perhaps one of the critical issues of our age uh, in that terrorism is is something that is affecting all states today and on grounds that states are, are less and less uh, accustomed to deal with. And, and I think the danger is that fundamental freedoms can be sacrificed in the name of national security or in, in, in the name of fighting against terrorism. And it's crucial that states do not succumb to the arbitrariness and the imprecision of the behavior of terrorists in their efforts to restrict terrorism. Um, this, such arbitrary behavior by states when it happens actually fuels the resentment um, and is a recruiting officer for terrorism. So it's critical that in, in pursuit of uh, steps to combat terrorism, states have to be very precise in the way they do this, and they have to be very rigorous in upholding standards. One thing that we've observed is that states often feel that their societies demand this kind of behavior of them, that societies succumb to the language of fear and want to see states uh, take measures that move towards a violation of human rights in order to protect them. We've been so concerned about this that um, this summer we did some surveys looking at the, the, the willingness of societies to engage with armed actors and to see their governments and to see intergovernmental actors engage with armed actors rather than just uh, engage with them from a, a perspective of dialogue rather than just from a perspective of, 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 of imprecise or securitized measures. And our findings were very clear that, that and this was a survey work that we undertook in the United Kingdom, Germany, and the United States. So obviously only three states, and, and we surveyed over 4,000 people. Uh, but the, the message was very clear. There is an appetite in societies to see measures that engage with root causes and engage with actors who get drawn into these patterns of behavior. And I think it's important that we see distinctions between those that perpetrate terrorist behavior and those insurgents that stick to political agendas and don't target civilians. 
Uh, and sometimes I think the lines get uh, blurred, and, and that then, I think, undermines the credibility of states. And when they reduce the, the terrain for the respect for rights, it, it undermines their credibility. Well, our panel is um, shortly ending, so I would like to return to the broader themes that we've been discussing now and looking ahead to this meeting over the next few days and also to the next few years, I would like each of you to perhaps provide some concluding thoughts on what can be do done to restore the balance and safeguard the human dimension. I think a lot can be done. Uh, if there is something that is happening, you can see in many member states it's, uh, there is a lot happening. So I think we have to be very attentive to national developments in some of the member states where um, these, uh, what I call this hunger for democracy, unsatisfied um, um, democratic uh, demands are sometimes uh, reshaping, for instance, the, the classic uh, right-left divide or are reshaping the structures of parties. Uh, we need to observe that and make sure that whilst that is happening, again, we are holding on very firmly to the fundamental freedoms. Because democracies can adapt. After all, they do. That's what they do um, uh, throughout, throughout, uh, throughout history. But what cannot be adapted is the, uh, cannot be changed, cannot be touched, is the protection of fundamental rights and the basic tenets of democracy, uh, the separation of power, the, um, uh, the checks and balances, and free and fair elections. So uh, what needs to happen is requires a lot of more vigilance, uh, sometimes firmness, a lot of firmness, vigilance, but also requires a certain degree of perspective, trying mm -hmm. to understand how uh, our citizens in, in 10 years and our citizens were changing because this, most of our citizens in fact come from from uh, the south of the of Europe so mm -hmm. whilst we uh, we um, we try to understand what our citizens will be made of uh, and how they will be integrated in society uh, something that was touched upon uh, today we must envisage forms of democracy and of expressions that would keep the social peace, that will ensure that uh, our member states uh, will, will have uh, democratic expressions that are within keeping with fundamental values. And what are you personally doing um, with this in your own work at the moment? Well, very personally, we're organizing, because this, the, these questions are so complex, we're organizing early November a forum, World Forum of Democracy. And the question of the, we're asking is, is populism a problem? Question mark. And we're trying to see um, how populist forces, again, have an impact on uh, traditional uh, party structures on the one hand, and how they impact media, traditional media, on the other hand. But what we seek to uh, do at this forum is to look at initiatives around the world, uh, we're going to test them, mm -hmm. that have uh, found solutions in addressing these problems. Uh, for instance, we're looking into um, whether, you know, by altering or changing the way in which you vote, whether votes can be done instead of choosing the person by giving votes, for instance, by giving negative or positive votes. Uh, there are many initiatives that can help us um, reduce populist tendencies and, uh, and ensure that, um, again, citizens find uh, adequate ways of, ex of expressing themselves. So, yes, we're going to look into that and hopefully we'll find some interesting initiatives that are worth, um, that are worth encouraging and pushing. Thank you. And Mr. Cohen, also your summary, what can be done to restore this balance in favour of the human dimension? Well, I think, first of all, it's great to be at the Human Dimension meeting and at the opening of a discussion for a couple of weeks at which these issues will be interrogated by representatives of states and civil society. To me, that is the essence of what the Human Dimension is about and if that can be done rigorously, that will make a huge contribution. I think we have to recognize that the normative consensus among participating states at the present time is weak, weaker than it has been for a long time. And it's not just about implementing human dimension uh, standards. It's about recognizing that there needs to be a return to the fundamental idea that gave birth to the OSCE, to the CSE, and that is that this needs to be a platform for discussion of 
difficult issues, conversations that it's hard to have elsewhere, and the perspectives of the different participating states have to be listened to, have to be heard, and have to be interrogated by those within the OSC and by human rights activists outside. And if that conversation can be reinvigorated, then I think there's tremendous opportunity. Uh, if there is a reluctance to do that, then I think uh, the, the contribution that the OSC can make will be considerably diminished. Thank you, and please join me in thanking both our panelists here for this very fruitful um, panel right now. Thank you. Uh, I thank the uh, distinguished panelists and the moderator for their invaluable contribution to the uh, opening uh, plenary. But before we go to the uh, turn to the speakers list, I will give the floor to uh, the first deputy director of uh, ODIR with some technical information. Katarzyna, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Director. Director, um, I will add one technical information because it is technical, and this is to apologize again uh, for lack of interpretation of the statement by Ms. Lyudmila Alexeyeva, the chairperson of uh, the Moscow Helsinki Group, who um, reminded us how the Helsinki Final Act gave foundation to the human rights civil society movements across the OSC region and what role uh, they played in those early years. Um, with regards to the technical information, you have two documents, the timetable and the meeting manual. And in the manual, you will find all relevant information about this year's HDIM. So I will only highlight some important matters. For each of the sessions that will start from this afternoon, the list of speakers will be open one hour prior to the start of the session, inside or outside plenary hall, and it will be limited to 50 speakers per session. Therefore, it might be closed before the start of the session once the limit is reached. So kindly make sure that you sign up early and on time. Once the limit of uh, 50 speakers is reached, Participants will be signed up in order of appearance on the reserve list, and the reserve list will be used in case no show out, show, no, of no shows from the main list. Participants signed up in the main list and reserve list can also agree bilaterally uh, to exchange places, but that is subject to agreement individually between them. To allow as many participants as possible to speak, Speaking time will be limited, depending on the number of speakers, uh, and the time will be defined by the moderator. It will also be the moderator's role to keep strictly keep the time. Given this time limit, you are kindly encouraged to first present your recommendations and then give your reasons for those recommendations. You are also encouraged to submit your interventions to the HDIM documentation desk so that they can be uploaded uh, to the documents distribution system. To facilitate good translation, please provide your notes or statements, if you have any, to the interpreters. You can give such notes to the documentation desk before the session. They will not be distributed further unless you specifically ask for it. ODIR will continue to compile all recommendations emerging from this meeting. To achieve this, please submit your recommendations to the Documentation Center as a separate document. And to facilitate speed and accuracy, we would prefer that you do so in an electronic format. Final recommendations will be distributed after HDIM in the consolidated summary, as every year. Each session, apart from the opening and closing session, will have a rapporteur assigned that will produce a summary of the session. The report from the first week will be available online in the second week, and the report from the last week, a part of the last session, will be circulated before the closing plenary. All reports will be included in the final consolidated summary of HDIM. As you can see, uh, we have live streaming again, and uh, you can note that all sessions are live streamed on the HDIM website. You may also visit the website um, uh, and its uh, highlight page where you can find the updates from the meeting. 
and you can enter the HDM 2017 website from the main ODR website uh, and follow HDM on Twitter with the hashtag of hash HDM 2017. There are also a number of interesting side events scheduled in the course of the implementation meeting 92 to be precise. Uh, they are indicated in the timetable and in some more details uh, in the overview of side events that you all should have received. And they are also on the website. Delegates room as, were, as well as room for other participants are located on this floor with a number of computers and other office equipment. If in doubt, please ask uh, some of the staff members in the corridors to point you to those rooms. There is also a cafeteria available to HDM participants during the whole meeting in the HDM foyer. The map and transport recommendations are included in your brief packs and please approach the welcome and information desk in case you need any guidance on this. After this plenary session we would kindly ask you, at, it is also at the request of the host of this venue, to familiarize yourself with emergency exit procedures to be followed in case of fire or other accidents. You can see the exit emergency exit signs um, and please familiarize yourself with their location. During the entire HDM, oh dear staff will be available to answer your questions. Ms. Saida Manieva, uh, the uh, meeting officer, and you can uh, is the meeting officer and can address her on the or the welcome and information desk in case of any questions. Welcome and information desk will also offer information on the meeting, including about cultural and social events. I am also pleased to announce that's always the most pleasant part that several receptions will take part in the next few days. Tonight, our Polish hosts are offering a reception for all participants of the HDM at 6 o'clock in the afternoon in meeting room 1 here at the HDM venue. Um, our Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights will host a reception next week on 19 September at Villa Foxal at 8 o'clock in the evening. Invitations will be distributed closer to the event. And finally, the OSC Austrian Chairmanship will hold, host a reception next Thursday on 21st September. Details will be communicated at a later stage. To enter the receptions, kindly bring your badge and photo ID with you. Uh, otherwise, uh, the security might uh, question your ability to access. The exact information, including the addresses, will be available in the meetings manual that you have received. I wish you a very interesting and productive discussion and return the floor to the director. Thank you, thank you, Katarzyna. Uh, this was a lot of technical information. I hope you have absorbed it, <laughs> but uh, we can come back to some of them at a later stage. But as you all know, OSCE is a collective effort. And before we turn to the speakers list and in cooperation with the Austrian Chairmanship, I would like to uh, invite the representatives of the Troika to make uh, their statements. I have here Dr. Gerno Erler, Special Representative on OSCE of the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and Ambassador Alessandro Assoni, Head of the Permanent Mission of Italy to the OSCE. I give the floor to our German uh, friend. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. I will speak in German. Sehr geehrte und dear Direktorin Frau Ingemann. Director, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, allow me to thank you and the Austrian chairmanship for the preparation of this very important conference. The comprehensive program for the coming two weeks emphasizes the multifaceted nature of the discussions we are suffering we are dis discussing here with regards to the human dimension. We need to look at these issues in detail and also address the shortcomings in the implementation. The effective implementation of the human rights uh, provisions of the Helsinki and Paris agreements and also uh, further agreements made at the political level is the measure by which we can assess our work. 
the guaranteeing of human rights, uh, freedom and uh, strong civil society are preconditions for stability and security. The human dimension is a cornerstone of the comprehensive security philosophy of the OSCE. And the effective implementation of our commitments is not something that we can lose sight of if we want to further bolster the rule of law, democracy, and human rights. Each year, HDM offers us the, opp the opportunity uh, to address sensitive issues, to promote good practice and exchange with one another. So as a representative of the Troika here, I'm delighted to be in such a large meeting of participants. It's good to see so many representatives of the civil society, which is also fundamental of fundamental importance in holding up a mirror to us all. Uh, so that we can effectively implement human rights and fundamental freedoms. Now, as state representatives, looking at this mirror is not always easy, but it's absolutely essential if we're going to reach our objectives in the human dimension. Allow me to address an important point in closing. The OSCE can only be strong in all of its dimensions if um, we don't forget how to build consensus as states. So we need strong dialogue. We need to build trust with one another so that we can assure the operative effectiveness of the OSCE in conflict prevention, conflict management, and conflict solution. You can rest assured, ladies and gentlemen, that Germany will continue, even after its time as a Troika member, to strengthen the human dimension and promote its values. We have all committed to this as participant states, and we understand it as a fundamental precondition for a stable, safe, and prosperous society. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Uh, thank you. And now I have uh, uh, Italy, Ambassador Alexandro Assoni. Thank you, Madam Director. Dear Ingeborg, I will speak in Italian. Cari colleghi, desidero prima di tutto. Dear colleagues, let me start by thanking the Deputy Minister, Mr. Linhart, for his statement, which was so full of interesting thoughts, and especially for all of the very important work done by the Austrian chairpersonship in connection, of course, uh, with the appointment uh, of OSC representatives who are with us. Uh, I also welcome Madame Tide from the OSC Parliamentary Assembly who is with us today. I wish you all full success uh, in this uh, conference. I can assure you, of course, of the full support of Italy in the course of its upcoming chairpersonship. And I would also like to congratulate and thank the director of Odir, all the staff of Odir and the host country for the excellent organization of this uh, very important uh, meeting of the OSCE, which brings together so many good uh, participants. Uh, since uh, the Helsinki Act, uh, I think that we have all worked hard uh, to uh, ensure the absolute uh, acceptance of human rights uh, as a basis uh, for peace uh, and for uh, the development of uh, cooperation and friendly relations among states. We have all committed ourselves uh, to this. Uh, I think we all understand that fundamental rights uh, require a constant, uh, uh, unflagging commitment uh, if uh, they are to uh, support uh, security and uh, peace. Uh, uh, among states. Uh, now, civil society has to be involved, uh, but also uh, universities, uh, employers groups, uh, the media, and many other groups. Uh, within the OSC, dialogue with civil society is important for all aspects of the human dimension. The extraordinary work, uh, for instance, uh, done under the present chairpersonship on the issue of young people and combating radicalization uh, of the support of the executive structures of the OSCE in this regard. In the area of the human dimension, civil society has an absolutely crucial role to play to promote human rights, to ensure the rule of law, and we expect uh, that this role will be played in a responsible and serious manner. The conference starting today is an unparalleled opportunity 
to review with civil society all of the achievements that we have under the belt, but also what needs to be done in the future to overcome future problems. What are the best practices? Uh, the challenges to security, tourism, the new forms of intolerance, migratory flows, uh, all of this is making it uh, more than ever necessary uh, to have a global approach to the human dimension and to all of the other pillars. And none of these uh, challenges can be met uh, without uh, a, an unflagging commitment to the cause of human rights. And that is the approach that has been adopted by Italy for the guiding thread of its uh, conference uh, in October in Palermo on Mediterranean cooperation. Now, ensuring security in the OSCE area uh, is indivisible from the promotion of human rights, the rule of law, and democracy. We have been saying this uh, since uh, ancient times. The freedom and security go hand in hand. Those are two sides of the same coin. One cannot exist uh, without the other. And that is why I would like to close uh, by recalling the uh, words uh, of a great uh, specialist uh, on Italian history who died just a few years ago, the uh, international law in, uh, on human rights uh, is a spirit of building bridges, uh, of including all cultural, all cultures, uh, uh, all societies, all groups, and I hope that that is the spirit in which we will work during this conference. Statements by delegation of uh, participating states but before I do that, I just want to remind all of you that uh, not to exceed three minutes per, per speaker to ensure that uh, everybody can, that is on the list can, can speak. So please try to stick to, to three minutes. I have here first on my list, it's Ukraine. Well, thank you, Madam Chairperson, Excellencies. Ladies and gentlemen, the delegation of Ukraine is grateful to the ODIR and the Austrian OEC chairmanship for organizing the 2017 Human Dimension Implementation Meeting. Our special thanks go to our Polish friends for their warm hospitality. We entered a new era in 2014 when international legal norms and principles, including health and key principles pertaining to state sovereignty and territorial integrity, were blatantly violated by one OEC participating state. To our deep regret, this era is not a cold war, but a real hot war on the European continent. The OEC has also found itself in the new epoch following the appointment of the new OEC leadership and the new heads of the OEC institutions. Perhaps in a clever design, all 57 members entered this morning the meeting through a tunnel. Let us hope that under the new OEC institution's leadership, guided by the Swiss Secretary General, our way to the light of, at the end of the tunnel will be much shorter than the longest European tunnel of 57 kilometers of Gatard base. All protocol observed, I skip a long paragraph concerning how much we appreciate the work of the predecessors and how much we are looking forward to work up with the new heads of the independent institutions. At present, the OEC and the whole European security order are under the biggest attack from one country. Ukraine's autonomous Republic of Crimea and Sevastopol remain occupied by Russia. Russian military and illegal armed groups, which Russia backs and arms, continue to operate in Donbass, killing Ukrainian servicemen and women and peaceful civilians. Over three years of illegal occupation of Crimea have been marked by blatant violations of basic human rights and fundamental freedoms of the Crimean population. It must remain our priority to seek by all available instruments the permanent monitoring and presence in Crimea of established human rights monitoring mechanisms of the UN, OEC, Council Europe, and other international organizations. This must be done in compliance with ANGA Resolution 68-262 and 71-205. We call on, call on the OEC institutions to use all po uh, possibilities to secure the immediate release of the illegal, illegally detained Ukrainian citizens, political prisoners in Russia, including Alexei Sov, 
Alexander Kolchenko, Stanislav Klich, Mikola Karpiuk, Andrew Mann Sushinka, as well as Achtem Chigois, Mikola Semena in the occupied Crimea. The most recent case of a 19-year-old Ukrainian, Pablo Grip, who was kidnapped on the territory of the Republic of Belarus and transferred to the detention facility in the Russian Federation has become yet another appalling example of Russia's state policy of abduction and hostage taking, which should not have a place in the OEC area. Today, this morning, the Russian occupation authorities sentenced a Ukrainian citizen, a Crimean Tatar, Mr. Achtem Chigos, to eight years in a strict regime colony. It is surely a cynical, well-timed grin addressed to all of us who are gathered today to discuss human rights in the OEC area. We have to admit that the OEC and the, and the then existing European security architecture were unable to prevent and stop military aggression, occupation, and annexation. Having said that, OEC nevertheless remains an extremely useful organization. We highly value the role of the OEC special monitoring mission in Ukraine. We regret, however, that the OEC has never been consulted by Russia before putting forward proposal on so-called UN mission on support in protecting the SMM OEC in New York. Dear colleagues, I would like to remind you that under resolution on the human rights situation in Crimea established the facts. The time is out. The based, the facts based facts. I hope that the discussion that we will have in the next two weeks will not be a post-truth discussion framed by appeals to emotion and personal belief disconnected from the objective facts. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, dear colleagues, can I remind you to, to stick to the try to stick to the three minutes. You can see it in the corner of the, of the screen, the, the clock that counts down, and there's a signal of time out when time is out. And then I have here uh, Estonia that's speaking on behalf of the European Union. Thank you. I would like to give the floor to the representative of the European Union. Thank you very much, and I'll do my best to speak in, in three minutes, although please, uh, please remember that uh, we're actually saving you 93 minutes of uh, statements altogether, uh, because I speak not only on behalf of the European Union, also on, on behalf of Montenegro, Al Albania, and Bosnia and Herzegovina, who align themselves with the statement. The list is not final. Uh, it will be posted uh, with the, uh, with, it will be provided with a written uh, version of the statement. Uh, we wish, first of all, to congratulate you, uh, Mrs. Gisla Dotti, for your appointment as the new director of ODIR. You can count on the support of the EU and its member states. We're convinced that through its invaluable work, ODIR, as an autonomous institution, contributes to peace and stability throughout the OSCE area. We wish you all the best for your future work. We express our sincere appreciation for the efforts of the Austrian chairmanship in office to build consensus for the agenda of the HD. Uh, gratitude also goes to our Polish hosts and to Odir for the excellent preparation of this meeting. The struggle for the protection and promotion of human rights never ends. We support Odir's efforts to defend human rights and assist participating states to implement the OSCE's concept of comprehensive security. However, we note with regret that in parts of the OSCE area, the situation rather deteriorates than improves. Human rights and fundamental freedom, as provided for by international standards and OSCE commitments, are being denied or seriously hampered in many countries. The crackdown on human rights defenders, political dissent and civil society continues, while media outlets are shut down and journalists are arrested and imprisoned. Security reasons are often the excuse. The EU recalls that measures to combat terrorism and violent extremism must fully respect international human rights standards and fundamental freedoms. Combating and ultimately overcoming violent and unlawful behaviors will not succeed if the means to do so are not in conformity with human rights standards. There can be no sustainable security without human rights. Allow me now to refer to specific country situations. In eastern Ukraine, the volatile security situation increases the already very high number of civilian casualties and causes considerable damage to critical infrastructure, thus adding even more pressure to a dire humanitarian situation. 
The EU continues to urge all sides to ensure respect for international human rights and humanitarian law. We condemn the gross and systematic human rights violations committed by Russian-backed separatists in certain areas of Donetsk and Luhansk regions. We remain firm in our call on all sides to swiftly and fully implement the Minsk agreements and honor their commitments. We underline Russia's full responsibility in this regard and yet again call on Russia to exert its influence over the separatists it backs to meet those commitments in full. We regret that commitments made to ensure a lasting ceasefire have not been respected so far. The EU also calls for the unimpeded access of the OC and other international organizations to the whole territory of Ukraine, including to the Crimean Peninsula. The EU will continue to support the vital work of the OC and its special monitoring mission, including through financial and material assistance. We deplore the tragic incident incident involving an SMM team on 23 April, which killed one SMM patrol member and injured two others. It is a stark reminder that all sides must fully guarantee the security and safety of the SMM monitors and ensure their full, free and unhindered access throughout the country, including to the Ukraine-Russia state border. We note the progress made so far by Ukraine in the implementation of its national human rights strategy and the related action plan. We call on the Ukrainian government to continue stepping up its efforts to implement the necessary reforms. We also stress the need for a comprehensive and inclusive approach toward all its citizens. We call on Russia to seize the illegal annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. We note with increasing concern reports by the OHCHR on the violations of human rights and the precarious situation of persons belonging to national minorities in the peninsula, in particular the Crimean Tatars. The banning of their mejlis and the ongoing persecution of their representatives constitute a grave attack on the rights of all Crimean Tatars. The harassment of human rights defenders, lawyers and journalists complement the bleak picture of the human rights situation on the peninsula. The EU continues its call for the full implementation of the 2016 ANGA Resolution on the Human Rights Situation in Crimea, including full cooperation with international human rights monitoring mechanisms. The EU renews its call on to free all Ukrainian citizens illegally detained, put on trial or convicted in Russia and in the illegally annexed Crimean Peninsula. Furthermore, the EU continues to observe the ongoing crackdown on civil society in Russia, in particular through the implementation of the foreign agents law and the curtailing of rights and freedoms, in particular freedom of association and peaceful assembly. Recently adopted measures will limit internet freedom and increase the levels of censorship. The repression against the opposition has become even more evident since the large demonstrations of 26 March and 12 June. This is especially worrying in the context of the upcoming elections. Human dignity and the right to life are not respected in Chechnya, where among other grave human rights violations, reported abductions, torture and killings of LGBTI persons are still to be thoroughly investigated. We urge the Russian authorities to fulfill their commitment to a full and thorough investigation and hold those responsible to account. Jehovah's Witnesses were banned earlier this year because of extremism, thus significantly limiting freedom of religion or belief. In short, the human rights situation continues to fall below Russia's OSCE commitments and international human rights obligations. We have expressed our concerns on these developments both publicly and in meetings with Russian officials. On Georgia, we remain concerned at the deteriorating human rights situation in Georgia's breakaway regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. We call for access for hum international humanitarian rights, monitoring mechanisms through these regions, and underline Russia's responsibility in this regard. In Azerbaijan, the EU remains worried about human rights and fundamental freedoms in the country, including freedom of expression and the freedom of the media, which are fundamental elements of any demographic society. The EU reiterates its I call to the government to ensure... The time limits. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a feeling that I will never respect your, your deadline, so we will be posting your, uh, the full uh, text on the website. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you. Thank you. M much appreciated. Uh, then I have uh, uh, the Russian uh, Federation. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll take advantage of this opportunity once again uh, to congratulate you on your appointment to an important position. Uh, and in fact, thanks to some agreements reached in uh, Mauerbach, we have managed uh, to uh, fill a number of important uh, vacancies in the various executive structures of the OSCE, and uh, it is to be hoped uh, that the organization will be able to operate uh, effectively. 
but uh, coming back uh, to my uh, previous comment, uh, now I, as a head of delegation, are given uh, three minutes. Uh, now, uh, the uh, experts, uh, well, it's very nice of them to teach us about uh, some uh, history. I mean, we're always uh, prepared to hear out uh, respectful experts. But I don't think it's appropriate to, to uh, give uh, a, um, some more time to experts uh, to the detriment of uh, national representatives. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, now uh, the human rights uh, defender from uh, Moscow is uh, very respected. She has contributed greatly to the development of a civil society. But uh, perhaps uh, we could uh, invite uh, Martin Luther King III. Perhaps he could tell us about Charlottesville, some other problems that have arisen with the defense of human rights and are being completely ignored. I mean, let's have a more balance in the future. But coming uh, to facts uh, or to my main comments uh, uh, now. Uh, first of all, the events in Ukraine and how the institutions of the OSC are approaching this. Uh, now, we cannot accept uh, the current uh, practice of our organization uh, of um, the uh, not engaging, of the OSC not engaging in a dispassionate analysis of the situation in Ukraine. We mentioned this last year, but nothing has changed uh, since. Uh, for a number of years now, there has been this internal armed conflict uh, uh, which was uh, caused, fomented uh, by forces uh, that came to power in Kiev as the result uh, of a state a coup d'etat with the use of force. Uh, uh, and now we're being taught by them uh, how to engage in human rights. Uh, well, thanks very much uh, for lessons uh, from that uh, side. I would like to remind the distinguished representative of the EU that uh, for peace, uh, security uh, in the territory called the Russian Federation, uh, well, that is the responsibility of the government of the Russian Federation and not uh, the EU. So focus on your own problems uh, rather than being patronizing and teaching our uh, experts, our authorities, uh, how we should deal with human rights. Uh, uh, thank you for the uh, very uh, positive assessment of uh, human rights. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, it would seem that the problems uh, exist only in Chechnya and not elsewhere. In Ukraine, there are flagrant, massive violations of human rights, uh, which are not uh, criticized at all by the OSCE. There's a huge concern when it comes uh, to the freedom of the media in that country. And we cannot uh, close our eyes to the fact uh, that uh, Kiev is not meeting its international commitment when it comes to combating nationalism, racism, uh, and uh, neo-Nazi ideas and ideologies. Uh, uh, I would call on distinguished uh, colleagues uh, not uh, to uh, continue to uh, tell stories uh, uh, about uh, uh, violations of human rights in Crimea. I mean, that's absolutely uh, absurd nonsense. Uh, it's uh, uh, ridiculous uh, to consider that we occupied Crimea only with a view to uh, violating human rights uh, there. Uh, I, I mean, if there are individual cases uh, of uh, of human rights, uh, they are appropriately prosecuted. Uh, we hear these uh, fables, uh, these uh, fairy tales uh, from time to time uh, to the effect uh, that there are supposedly massive violations of human rights in Crimea, but that is not the case, uh, quite the contrary that we do not allow international observers to come to Crimea. That's another myth, a myth which is repeated over and over ad nauseum in international fora. Crimea is open for visits by international observers in full accordance with the international commitments of the Russian Federation, we are prepared to allow representatives of appropriate authorities and structures that have within their terms of reference the right to monitor events in the Russian Federation. That is no problem. Ah, yes, I could, of course, stop with that, but I have another five pages. But given the uh, rules uh, that uh, we have all adopted, I will try to bring this uh, quickly uh, to a close. 
Uh, I very much hope that with double stand dual standards it will come to an end. We are prepared to open. We're fully open uh, to cooperation in the third pillar of the human dimension. And just to have uh, finger pointing uh, and uh, suggesting that there is one country that is blocking all forms of cooperation, that is a uh, mendacious assessment of the situation within our organization. So please uh, let us bring that to an end. Thank you. Turkey on my list. Thank you, Madam Chair. I may, I, I may exceed the usually allotted time limit. I, dis, I do seek your indulgence as the messages I have to impart are of great importance. Moreover, uh, you will also realize that our final balance in the utilization of time will be in favor of others. I begin by recognizing Ms. Gisladotir as she embarks upon her first HTM as our new ODIR director. I would also like to express our appreciation to our Polish hosts for their traditional generous hospitality. This HDM commences at a time where our common security and stability are faced with multifaceted risks. Numerous terrorist attacks have claimed so many innocent lives since last September. We offer our condolences over all those who perished in those dastardly attacks which targeted our common values and therefore all of us. They have caused and deepened a sense of insecurity, also exacerbating already existing evil phenomena such as racism, racial discrimination and xenophobia. Within this context, they have fanned the rise of Islamophobia in large swathes across the OSC. This is particularly dangerous dynamic, where exclusion and alienation on the one hand, radicalization and violence on the other fuel each other. We have to break the cycle. Madam Chair, this, the HTM is the most important forum in the OSC human dimension. It provides a unique opportunity to collectively make progress in this vital area of human It is essential to make the best use of this meeting to develop a common understanding and narrative with regard to the challenges and risks that threaten the delicate balance between security and rights and freedoms. The participation of the true representatives of civil society enriches HDM. We value their work and contribution to the advancement of human rights. But we must be vigilant against those who wish to infiltrate our meetings for ulterior motives. Our times are clouded by the crisis in and around Ukraine, by the scourges of terrorism and racism, by stresses caused by massive influx of refugees and migrants. Turkey is deeply affected by all these emergencies. We, moreover, are still trying to grapple with and uproot an insidious terrorist organization that tried to hijack our state apparatus, first by infiltration and then by outright violence. Just like in other areas, we believe we are justified in expecting full cooperation and solidarity from our partners in our quest to deliver justice to those who killed hundreds of our citizens and bombarded our parliament for their sinister objectives. Madam Chair, my initial statement was what I read out, with some minor differences in concluding paragraphs wishing success. Now I have come to the part we were compelled to add at the last minute. Madam Chair, the OSC is a security organization. It aims at bolstering our security through its unique concepts and toolbox. If the OSC does not serve to bolstering our security, then it will have diverged from its intent and purpose. We carefully examined the participants to this year HDM. Among them is a so-called NGO, namely the journalist and writer from quotes, some moments ago. I referred to the coup attempt in my country last year that was staged by a terrorist organization led by Fethullah Gülen. Well, according to the website of this so-called NGO, guess who they have as their honorary president. It is the same Fethullah Gülen. It is simply thing that I will be expected to sit around the same table with persons so closely linked to those who used our own military equipment, including fighter jets and tanks, to murder 250 of our citizens, to wound over 2,000 others, to bombard our parliament, and to 
overthrow our elected government and to assassinate our president. This entity is so closely linked to the Fethullah's terrorist organization, FETÖ, that it was among the first to be banned in Turkey, less than two weeks after the attempted coup horror. The United Nations also took action against this entity, revoking its consultative status within, with the ECOSOC earlier this year. But here we are in a meeting brandishing their names among its participants, despite the alerts we gave in line with the relevant OEC commitments, including Helsinki document, which prevents the participation of those resorting to the use or publicly condoning terrorism or the use of violence. Madam Chair, this is not the way to advance security as the OEC intends. This is certainly not the way to advance human rights. To the contrary, this is a betrayal to the OEC, which we helped establish and flourish over the decades. We will certainly continue on this path of both to both protect and assist our organization in its noble quest to advance our security. This is why we will not be part of this betrayal. It is also with the same spirit that we will take any additional measure and stance we may deem necessary to ensure that such betrayal does not recur. It saddens me deeply that our official delegation has to leave this HDM, but I reassure you, that this is done with the sole purpose of protecting the OHC itself. Thank you and goodbye. Uh, I uh, deeply regret that Turkey has decided to leave uh, the meeting, but I will get uh, back to this at the end of this uh, session. Uh, I have now 12 more speakers on the list, and I will have to close the list of uh, speakers from now. And now I have on my, my list of speakers, uh, USA. Madam Chair, the OSCE's comprehensive security concept lists respect for human rights within states to lasting security and cooperation among states. Where respect for human rights is weak, stability is not as stable as it seems, and international peace is at risk. The conflagration that Russia ignited in Ukraine and continues to fuel there threatens the local population. Russian authorities target Crimean Tartars, ethnic Ukrainians, and others who oppose their illegal occupation. The Ukrainian people are unwavering in their commitment to realize a future of greater integration with Europe. Russia also tries to coerce Moldova and Georgia from deepening their integration with Europe and engages in interference in the democratic processes which in constitute a threat to all OSCE participating states. In Russia, opposition figures and independent journalists are physically attacked with impunity. Civil society groups are labeled as foreign agents without any pretense or proof that they are uh, acting for foreign governments. And beyond Russia, independent voices are under pressure in multiple participating states. Today, as my country solemnly marks the anniversary of September 2011-2001 terrorist attacks, our hearts go out to people of Spain and Finland. We seek partners to defend against ISIS and Al-Qaeda. But let me be clear. Governments that in the name of counterterrorism crack down on peaceful human rights defenders, political opponents, journalists, and peaceful members of religious or ethnic minorities do so to serve their own ends, not to strengthen the security of their countries. There can be no place among us for anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim, anti-Christian, anti-Roma discrimination or racism. There can be no room for hate crimes against anyone, including LGBTI individuals, migrants, and persons with disabilities. Regrettably, none of our countries is free from hate. The United States is firmly committed to upholding freedom of expression. And this means that the handful of white supremacists, Ku Klux Klan, neo-Nazis, and other assorted anti-Semites, racists, and bigots have a right, right to, their, to express their disgusting views as long as they do so peacefully. At the same time, the overwhelming majority of my fellow Americans, including the president, other senior leaders of the executive branch, as well as the leadership of both parties in our Congress, have rejected them and all that they represent. The fullest force of the law will be brought against those responsible for the violence in Charlottesville, including the killing of Heather Heyer. The apparent perpetrator of her death was immediately arrested by local law enforcement, Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division, and the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Western uh, District of Virginia have opened an investigation into the violence. The rule of law will prevail. 
The participation at HDIM of uh, civil society from across our region remains essential to the quality and integrity of our discussions. The United States continues to stand with civil society who work in Baku and Ashgabat, Moscow and Dushanbe, Ankara and Astana, Budapest, Bishkek, Minsk and Tashkent to defend human dignity, universal rights and democratic government. Human rights defenders are the heartbeat of the Helsinki process. I wish to thank Poland for hosting this annual gathering of the, and for the Office of uh, Democratic Institutions and Human Rights for organizing it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And now I have uh, Switzerland on the speaker's list. Thank you, Madam Chair. With the appointment process of the full four leaders of the organization's executive structures behind us, we should now focus our common efforts on strengthening the OSC in general and on implementing, uh, uh, implementation of our human dimension commitments in particular. Indeed, we see many human rights and fundamental freedoms, freedoms severely violated and restricted throughout the OSC region. Let us take the opportunity that the HND offers as a unique platform to exchange services and engage with civil society to strengthen the implementation of our joint commitments based on mutual respect, constructiveness, and inclusivity. We should not shy away from continuing to look at how to improve this valuable platform. It is in this context that Switzerland has been a strong advocate for moving the HDIM from September to May in order to avoid a collision with other important events at the UN level, notably the General Assembly in New York and the September Human Rights Council session in Geneva. Moving HDIM to spring would allow for our discussions at the HDIM to feed better into our preparations for the Ministerial Council. This is a purely procedural question, as we are not proposing to shorten the HDIM nor to move it away from Warsaw, but simply to hold the meeting in the year for the benefit of our agenda, of better participation of international NGOs, and better preparation of human dimension text for the Ministerial Council. We invite the incoming Italian chair to launch consultations for such a procedure so that it can materialize either in 2018 or in 2019. Madam Chair, our world is facing multifaceted challenges that require concerted action. As the larger, largest regional security organization, the OSC has an important role to play in the realization of the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development. This is a human security issue that concerns us all. Peace and security cannot be achieved without sustainable development, which in turn cannot be achieved without full respect of human rights for all individuals. This is why we need to strengthen synergies between the OSC and other international and regional organizations and bring our activities in line with the Agenda 2030. In closing, let me reiterate Switzerland's full support to the men and the work of ODI, the RFOM, and HCNM. The three autonomous institutions have been established by the OSC participating states in order to support us in the implementation of OSC commitments, but also to point out violations of these commitments wherever and wherever they occur in the OSC area. We look forward to continuing our excellent cooperation with these three institutions under their new leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I have uh, Uzbekistan on my, my list. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, allow us to congratulate all of the new leadership positions within the institutional structures of the OSC, the director, the high commission, and the special representative for freedom of the media. We'd also like to support the idea of a high-level panel. Uh, this is an issue which is a key matter. Um, 
throughout the history of humankind. The issue of conflict has been ever present. What we have to do is to move away from a culture of conflict towards a culture of peace. Adopting um, conflict, not by adopting aggressive positions, but uh, through a spirit of cooperation, which the panelists talked about. Secondly, in Uzbekistan and Odia, we seen a high level of dialogue between uh, our country and the institution. We've had the delegation of our country in Warsaw, and we've reached fundamental agreements on all aspects of the mandate of Odia. In December last year, there was an election for a president. Now, for the first time, we had um, a delegation of observa for observation being sent abroad. Uh, we had um, representatives of six member states. Uh, the president elected was Shabkat Mijoyev, and all of the observers recorded uh, democratic open elections. In conclusion, his observation mission resulted in a national plan of action to implement recommendations of the ODIA, and we're putting together an election code. As a result of this, we've taken actions in five areas of priority uh, in order, if you like, to establish a roadmap in our country for implementing the Sustainable Development Goals. We've opened uh, the access both virtually and uh, in reality for uh, access and consultation with the President, which has received more than a million uh, messages and requests to the President. This year, we had the visit of the um, United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights to Uzbekistan. We've been taking measures to improve cooperation uh, with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and that was something that was f um, uh, fully accepted by our Parliament. So I'd like to invite Odia to the Tashkent International Conference on progress, or rather development progress indicators for human rights in the country. And we want to cooperate very closely with all of our partners. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I have uh, Kyrgyzstan. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Distinguished uh, uh, participants in this meeting, uh, we as a Republic of Kyrgyzstan would like to thank uh, the Polish hosts. Uh, uh, and also uh, thank uh, ODIR for the excellent organization of this meeting. The Warsaw meeting has uh, been for a long time the um, largest scale meeting uh, of, on uh, human rights and the human dimension with civil society from 57 member states uh, gathering here. And we hope that this will uh, contribute to, to further consolidation of uh, democracy, fundamental freedoms, and human rights. Uh, and throughout the history of the HDM meeting in Warsaw, uh, Kyrgyzstan has always uh, been a very active uh, participant. Uh, this year, we are celebrating the 26th anniversary of uh, our freedom, and we have been moving toward further consolidation of democracy, the rights of citizens, uh, human rights, on the basis of universal human values. Uh, through the years of its independence, uh, we have moved closer and closer to a strong democracy with deep-reaching reforms being implemented in various spheres by the government, always in consultation with the civil society. In the Kyrgyz Republic, we have a parliamentary form of government. We have democratic structures and democratic institutions that are becoming stronger and stronger and that are in accordance with various international 
governance and tax uh, that we find. Uh, and uh, the novelties introduced uh, into our um, legislation must always uh, be based uh, on the principles of democracy and respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. Now, distinguished participants, uh, we will be having uh, presidential elections in just a month, uh, and this is of historic importance uh, for the Republic of Kyrgyzstan. We will have, uh, and we have had in the past already, a, a peaceful, free, and fair transmission of power from one uh, administration to another, a, a new president, uh, and the assistance of uh, ODIR for automatic uh, counting of votes and for ensuring full transparency and openness of voters' lists is very important. Uh, we are very interested in opening in whole transparent uh, and free and fair elections. Uh, we will have 400 observers uh, from ODIR to help us uh, in this. And uh, this uh, such observation in the past has uh, contributed to better and better uh, elections. Uh, and the uh, assessment of the uh, Parliamentary Assembly of OSC and of ODIR of our uh, parliamentary elections in 2015 show that we can uh, succeed in this regard. Now, various uh, OSC initiatives uh, to improve uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms uh, um, are very appropriate, but they must take into consideration the national, regional, historic, and religious uh, specificities uh, of uh, the countries uh, involved. Uh, and uh, we will certainly work uh, to protect uh, the individual political, social, and civil rights. We are certainly open, I would just say in closing, to further cooperation on the basis of a full mutual respect. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And now I have the Holy See. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to deliver a shorter version of my statement. statement. The full text will be made available through the Document Distribution Center. Madam Chair, my delegation wishes to take this opportunity to congratulate you on your appointment as Director of the ODIR. Madam Chair, since the previous HDMs, the Holy See has been outlining in significant detail its position on human, in the main human dimension issues that face the 57 participating states. These statements make available to both delegations and representatives of civil society the well-known and principle-based views of the Holy See. Therefore, I would take this opportunity to dwell briefly on a few key concepts related to human rights and fundamental freedoms in general. In the compendium of the social doctrine of the Church, human rights are described as universal, inalienable, and inviolable. These three characteristics stem from the deepest foundation stone, namely the divine given nature of human dignity. Human rights are universals, universal, since they apply to all humans without exception of time, place, or subject. They are inviolable insofar as they are inherent in the human person and are expressions of human dignity. And because the proclamation of these rights demands complete respect for every person and enjoys respect for every person everywhere. Finally, these rights are inalienable insofar as whoever he or she may be can legitimately deprive others of these rights since this would contradict their very nature. The Holy See has furthermore often expressed concern about removing these rights from their proper context, restricting the range of application of rights and permitting the meaning and interpretation of rights to vary and their universality to be denied in the name of different cultural, cultural, political, and social perspectives. Such an approach, similar to one that considers human rights and fundamental freedoms as privileges granted by the state to be revoked whenever it pleases, 
does lasting harm to the very idea of human rights and certainly impairs their enjoyment by every man and woman. As Pope Francis has stated, the dignity of the human, human person and the common good rank higher than the comfort of those who refuse to renounce their privileges. Therefore, the term human right must be strictly and prudently applied, lest it become a rhetorical catch-all, endlessly expanded to suit the passing whims of the age. Such an elastic approach would discredit the very concept of human rights. A reminder of the to time the proper limits. understanding of human rights, the Holy See lends its moral support and thereby encourages the states to make fundamental human rights a fundamental freedoms a reality for all. Just maybe one thing, this, in this regard, it would be uh, advisable to recognize that calls to expand OSC commitments without acknowledging the specific approach of the OSC as a regional security arrangement only to dilute OSC programs and projects and to duplicate activities of other organizations. At the same time, it should be noted that the concept of interpretation cannot be used in a way that leads to a substantial amendment, overruling or transforming existing OSC commitments, since such an approach would be in contrast with the bona fide principle and the rules of procedures of the organization. Thank you very much. Uh, thank Thank you. Uh, I've been told that there is water dripping in here somewhere, and uh, yeah, and this, this will be fixed in the in the lunch. So don't don't worry for uh, for the time being. But now I have uh, uh, Canada on my list of speakers. They say, Madam Chair, that rain at a wedding, you know, brings good luck. So hopefully it'll bring us a good atmosphere for this HDM. Let me begin by congratulating you, along with the other three heads of the executive structures, on, their, on your appointments. Uh, we're very glad to have you here at HDIM. Excellencies, colleagues, representatives of civil society, as Canada's ambassador and permanent representative to the OSCE, I can assure everyone here of the great importance that Canada places on this meeting and the opportunity it presents. We fully support HDIM and the integral role it and civil society plays within the human dimension at the OSCE. We believe that civil society plays a vital role in fo fostering pluralistic, inclusive, and dem democratic societies. As one of the few fora, civil society is able to interact in a constructive manner with participating states. We regard HDIM as a unique and necessary exchange, even and perhaps most particularly, when we are told things we would rather not hear. At HDIM, civil society should be able to share their experiences and insights with us and to encourage and promote progress on the implementation of our shared human rights commitments. And all participating states are the better for it. They should not be censured or suffer retribution for coming to this meeting. Madam Chair, HDIM's relevance is further magnified as the shrinking of civil society space continues throughout many parts of the OSCE region. While there has been progress in the advancement of human rights and fundamental freedoms in many areas, we must also soberly reflect upon and address those areas where they face continuing and significant challenges and where human rights are being actively undermined. Worryingly, we have seen an overall trend over the last several years towards the erosion of democracy worldwide with an accompanying growing threat to civil society and the fundamental freedoms they defend. Although welcomed as a mean to, means to encourage the free flow of dialogue and knowledge, we also note that the internet has led to an increase in hate speech and other abuses and has been used to repress and persecute independent voices and at times resulted in undermining social cohesion and the polarization of societies. During these two weeks, you will repeat that Canada has found that we are stronger and more prosperous as a society when we respect our diversity and promote inclusion. Abuses and violation of human rights not only contravene international norms and commitments through the inequality, injustice, and deprivation they cause, but they also impede development, peace, and security. Experience shows that pluralism and respect for diversity strengthens societies and economies. 
when we respect and empower women, children, LGBTI persons, indigenous people, and minorities, when we respect the freedom to believe or to not believe, to peacefully assemble and associate, to express ourselves without fear of state reprisal, when we do all these things, we are not only doing what is morally and ethically right, we are also profiting from the positive effect that respecting fundamental rights has upon society. When we call limits. upon all particip participating states to uphold and advance their human rights commitments, it is not only because it is the right thing to do, but it is because also it is the only rational thing to do. Canada will continue to work hard to uphold ours. In conclusion, I encourage every participant over the span to work together constructively, openly, with respect, and with an objective of discovering the concrete ways that we can all work towards better implementation of our shared commitments in the human dimension. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And now I have Norway on the list. Thank you, Madam Chair. I join others in thanking ODIR for the impressive preparations for this meeting, despite the difficulties caused by the late adoption of the agenda again this year. I also want to express our appreciation to the Austrian Chairmanship for its tireless efforts to make this meeting take place. The Human Dimension Implementation Meeting is important, both as a platform to receive feedback from civil society and as a place to exchange best practices and debate challenges faced in implementing our Human Dimension commitments. It is certainly also with great pleasure we welcome you, Madam Chair, as the new Director of ODIR and we certainly look forward to cooperating closely with you. Oh dear, working with the participating states is an essential institution for the promotion of democracy, rule of law, human rights, tolerance and non-discrimination. And to this end, protecting and maintaining the autonomy of ODIR is important. ODIR and its director can count on our continued support. Democracy and respect for human rights and preconditions for are preconditions for securing peace and stability, both within and between states. And good governance and the rule of law are prerequisites for development, economic growth and innovation. A vibrant and robust democracy is a mosaic, a carefully balanced mixed mix of strong institutions and independent judiciary and an elected government and parliamentarians with the interest of the people at its core. And there is no democracy without a diverse and independent civil society, freedom of assembly and a free press. Individual freedoms are the foundation of any true democracy. Unfortunately, these fundamental elements of democracy are not present in all participating states. All democracies consist of majorities and minorities. Persons who belong to a minority within a minority are particularly vulnerable to discrimination and violence. And consequently, in order to fight multiple discrimination, the principle that human rights are for all, regardless of national or ethnic origin, sex, gender identity, color, religion or belief, language or any other status is essential. In many parts of the world, those who advocate their own and others' rights expose themselves to great danger. This is unacceptable. And standing up for human rights in the face of danger and repression requires tremendous courage. And therefore, the protection of human rights defenders is a key priority in the Russian foreign policy. We are very concerned that some governments, whose responsibility it is to protect and implement human rights, impose laws and policies that do the opposite. The freedoms of expression and association and the right to peaceful protest must be respected and protected. In conclusion, let me again stress that HDIM is important because it gives civil society an opportunity to tell us what they see as the most pressing concerns and human rights violations. And civil society plays an important role in holding governments to account. And civil society can act as a catalyst for change and contribute to development. And this is essential to fill the gaps in implementation that we all are facing. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now I have the Czech Republic on my list. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And the Czech Republic fully aligns itself with the intervention made earlier by the European Union. 
Uh, let me emphasize that uh, we are committed to a strong and fully functioning OSC, and of course uh, the AGDIM plays a pivotal role in this regard. Uh, we warmly welcome this year's selected topic, uh, topics in particular the topic of ensuring equal enjoyment of rights and equal participation in political and public life. As a participating state, as well as as the chair of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe and the current president of ECOSOC, the Czech Republic attaches great importance to participation. We believe that in order to facilitate an honest discussion on human dimension commitments, we must ensure that voices of all the different stakeholders are heard. We hope that the recent appointment of uh, the senior level representatives of the OSC Autonomous Institution and the OSC, OSC Secretary General will provide a much needed impetus for resuscitating such dialogue across the OSC. The Czech Republic stands ready to support the Secretary General, the High Commissioner on National Minorities, and the representative on freedom of the media in their efforts and wishes them all success. Against the backdrop uh, of the deteriorating situation of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the OSC area, heightened attacks uh, leveled at civil society, media, and persons belonging to minorities, it remains crucial to continue promoting and protecting, protecting the fundamental OSC commitments and principles. In this, in this context, and this is about our homework, we would like to highlight the recent positive development in the implementation of the Czech Republic's Roma integration strategy for 2015 and 2020. Uh, I mean, uh, I have in mind um, uh, the issue of uh, the former gypsy concentration camp in Lete Upisku. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, finally, the Czech Republic wishes to thank the host country, Austrian Chairmanship in Office and ODIR for convening uh, this year Human Dimension Implementation Meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, and now I have Armenia. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to start by expressing deep gratitude and appreciation to the hosts of HDIM, namely the government of Poland and ODIR. Furthermore, our thanks go to the Austrian chairmanship for setting and agreeing with all participating states a common agenda. Every year we get together in Warsaw to reaffirm the importance of our human dimension commitments by mutually monitoring each other, sharing good practices, and getting feedback from civil society. The Human Dimension Implementation Meetings have never lacked passion, dedication, and hot debates. We believe that this meeting will not be an exception as well. It seems we had a good start. However, while defending our national positions on each and every concrete issue, it's also important to look at the third dimension from wider <coughs> perspective of security and cooperation, particularly now when there are concentrated efforts to address divergent security perceptions in Europe through dialogue. We believe that the informal dialogue undertaken exclusively in the political military dimension would be incomplete since many causes of current crisis, which some in our organization attribute to the incompliance with Helsinki Final Act principles, occurred in the context of serious and repetitive human rights violations. After all, the use of force against equal rights and self-determination of peoples, along with systematic violations of human rights and fundamental freedoms, lie at the heart of many conflicts and crises in the OSC area. Thus, this meeting, as well as other human dimension events, should serve as an integral part of our inclusive dialogue re-establishing predictable, indivisible, and comprehensive security for all, based on implementation of all OSC principles and commitments. Madam Chairperson, it goes without saying that the OSC is as much about security as much it is about cooperation. It is through inclusive cooperation we have decided to help each other in implementing our joint OSC commitments. The OSC field missions have been designed as effective instruments of such a cooperation, and the OSC office in Yerevan was an excellent, if not exemplary, model of cooperation between the OSC and host country particularly in the light of incremental diminishment of the OSC presence in the South Caucasus. 
Unfortunately, those who closed the OEC office in Baku by invoking the sovereign rights of host country also closed the OEC office in Yerevan, this time by abusing the OEC principle of consensus. By closing the OEC office in Yerevan, Azerbaijan tries to create obstacles for Armenia in implementation of the OEC commitments, those same commitments which it failed to implement itself. In this regard, I would like to reaffirm that Armenia will continue to implement its human dimension commitments despite the closure of Yerevan office. And we look forward to ensuring continuous OSCE engagement in this regard. Finally, I would like to reconfirm the importance of human dimension in this renewed OSCE engagement. I thank you. Uh, thank you. And now I have uh, Iceland on my list. Thank you. I would like to start by offering my heartfelt congratulations to my fellow Icelander and former Minister for Foreign Affairs, Mrs. Ingibjörg Solun Gisladóttir, who is attending her first Human Dimension Implementation meeting in her capacity as the new Director of ODIR. We are extremely pleased to see her take up her duties and wish her success in the important job she has taken on. ODIR is the guardian of the human dimension within the OSCE. Its strength lies in the expertise, professionalism, and, it, and its hands-on approach. Its importance is probably greater than ever before, for these are testing times for those upholding human rights and democratic values. As ODIR director, Mrs. Kisladotir has a busy task ahead of her. She and the institutions she leads will face many battles, some with the participating states, in upholding the basic principles and values of the institution. In this, she can rely on our steadfast support. Madam Chair, like other Nordic countries, Iceland puts great emphasis on human rights and gender equality in its foreign policy, and ODIR can rely on our continued support in advancing the implementation of commitments within the human dimension. We count on other participating states to do the same. Iceland has prioritized women's, women's rights in our advocacy international stage. First of all, because we are strongly committed to gender equality and our commitments in that field. Also, because we feel we have something very specific to contribute on that front. We are also strongly committed to protecting and promoting the well-grounded principle of international human rights law that all persons are entitled to enjoying without any discrimination such as on the basis of sex, race, color or religion. Accordingly, accordingly, we will fight to do our utmost to combat and prevent all forms of discrimination and, and intolerance, including against Muslims and Christians, and, against, and we will fight against anti-Semitism as well. We expect that the director of OTIR, as, as well as, as political leaders of participating states, to speak out strongly and promptly for equality and against violations that occur. Madam Chair, we try to practice what we preach. Iceland regularly comes out near the top of the global indexes, whether concerning health and happiness, peace and stability, women's rights or LGBT, LGBTI rights. We did not get to where we are to today overnight. The human rights mechanism that has been set up for each state and respect has supported us and we take seriously our common commitments to protect and promote human rights under all circumstances. ODIR has played an important role for us in this regard, as it has in so many of the countries represented here today. Earlier this year, police and prosecutors received specialized training from ODIR on how to address hate crime in our society. ODIR has also been advising my government on best practices on how to set up and operate a national human rights institution. Have you mind the time limits? We are grateful for ODIR's support in both of these matters and encourage every one of you also to make use of its expertise and to heed its recommendations. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are not yet done, but we are already uh, 17 minutes past uh, uh, one o'clock and the uh, interpreters were not expecting Day longer than to until one o'clock, and I would like to thank them, spe especially for 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 taking this over, t uh, being here over uh, over the time. But uh, we have to continue from now on without interpretation, and uh, that applies to two speakers and then to.
uh, those who have asked for the floor uh, on the right to reply. I have now on my speakers list Serbia and Romania, and I hope they will be able to, to take the floor unless we don't have interpretation. Serbia. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. We express our appreciation to the Austrian OSCE Chairmanship in Office for organizing this year's Human Dimension Implementation Meeting to the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights for its preparation, as well as to our Polish hosts for their warm hospitality. The work of the OSCE institutions is one of the key elements of the OSCE's human dimension. Their mandates and capacities should be fully utilized, thus contributing to peace and stability. At a time when um, threats to security the entire OSC region are, um, are present, this becomes even more important. We would therefore like to congratulate Ms. Gisla Dottir as the newly appointed director of the ODIR, as well as to the other newly appointed heads of institutions. Uh, you will have Serbia's uh, um, full support in the implementation of your mandates. Ladies and gentlemen, in times of conflicts and crisis, the fundamental human rights are the ones that are first and the most affected. Therefore, we need to reconfirm our dedication to promotion and implementation of human dimension commitments, regardless of the challenges. The crises and protracted conflicts across the OSCE are becoming more frequent and complex. For the fourth consecutive year, the crisis in and around Ukraine is continuing despite all efforts. The overall security situation across the OSCE region remains fragile. Due to inter alia increased levels of intolerance, discrimination, disrespect for the protection of human uh, rights and freedoms, hate crimes targeting specific groups, migrants, refugees, national, minority, national and other minorities. The OSC participating states must do their utmost to find a sustainable solution to the growing challenges, which will be possible only through rebuilding trust and confidence within the OSC. While the OSC family is still searching for the best response to those challenges, it is clear that they can be successfully tackled only through our joint and consensual efforts. Within the human dimension in previous years, Serbia has been dedicated to the promotion of tolerance and non-discrimination, protection of rights of persons belonging to national minorities, the rule of law, freedom of religion, rights of refugees and IDPs, freedom of expression and freedom of the media, including safety of journalists, as well as gender and youth as cross-cutting issues. We are pleased to see that some of these topics remain very high on the agenda of the Austrian OSC chairmanship. We hope that prevented us from adopting new deliverables at ministerial council meetings, both in Hamburg and Belgrade, will be overcome at this year's ministerial conference in Vienna. Let me assure you that Serbia stands ready to act as a constructive and reliable partner along that way. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, thank you. And uh, this actually concludes the uh, opening statements of the uh, participating states, as uh, Romania has erased uh, uh, from the list, has withdrawn from the, from the list. But uh, now I have two uh, delegations that uh, want to use the right to reply. I have Ukraine and I have Azerbaijan. And I just want to remind them that there is one minute uh, uh, that they have to, to reply. And it's uh, Ukraine first. Thank you, Madam Chair. On behalf of Ukrainian delegation, we would like to reject uh, the tone how the Russian delegation presented and tried to use us uh, how we should uh, follow the uh, rules and how we implement the uh, rights of uh, human beings. Uh, we believe that uh, it is clear for everybody and everybody knows about the gross violations that taking place on the occupied territories of my state and uh, uh, we are here also to work on this together. I thank you. Uh, thank you and then it's Azerbaijan. 
Thank you very much. I would like to exercise the right of reply regarding the statement by the Armenian delegation. Um, so the armed conflict in and around the Nagorno-Karabakh region of the Republic of Azerbaijan has resulted in the occupation of almost one of the fifths of the territory of Azerbaijan. And approximately one out of every nine persons in the country an internally displaced person or a year refugee. The Republic of Armenia bears the primary responsibility for unleashing the war against Azerbaijan, occupying its territories, committing the most serious crimes of concerns to the international community during the conflict, carrying out ethnic cleansing on a massive scale and establishing the ethnically constructed so subordinate separatist entity on the captured Azerbaijan territory. And I would like to mention one thing that this year, in July 2017, uh, Armenian armed forces shelled the Alhanli villages, uh, village using mortars, including heavy granite uh, launchers. As a result of this provocation, two Time years old, out. just one minute, two years old, no. Zahra Guleva was wounded. The UNICEF associate director made this statement in the response to Azerbaijan Human Rights Commissioner's statement on the murder of two years old Azerbaijan Zahra Guleva. So uh, please make in, this into consideration and I call all the international community and the countries participating here to make the pressure on this because they're under the occupation, they still, the, uh, the uh, occupation is they still remain and the uh, Armenian side ignore all the international Time community and laws. Thank you very much Definitely for your passionate. <laughs> and then I have actually two more uh, delegation uh, that want to make uh, uh, statements or, or use the right to reply. I have the Russian Federation and Armenia. Uh, thank you very much. Madam Director, and I would like to realize the right for, uh, to respond and to comment on interventions by distinguished delegations from Ukraine and Estonia who spoke for the uh, European Union. And let me remind that Crimea and Sebastopol reunited with the Russian Federation on the referendum which has been organized in accordance with international law. And a couple of words to Estonia. We would like to remind that Russia is not party to the non-governmental uh, non uh, governmental armed conflict in the southeast of Ukraine. You should address Kiev authorities and ask them to fulfill the Minsk agreement, uh, not us. Also, I would tell that uh, in accordance with the current uh, political reality, Abkhazia and South Ossetia are independent states. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And uh, then I have Armenia. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I took note of the statement made by Azerbaijan. The content was surprising to me, but what was uh, surprising that it was presented as a right of reply to Armenia. Armenia did not refer to Nagorno-Karabakh conflict in its statement. It referred only to the closure of Yerevan office. I mean, I uh, certainly uh, that uh, Azerbaijan is trying to respond uh, to the closure of the OSC office in Yerevan by working his frustration of Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, it simply shows that Azerbaijan is taking hostage of all organization and it's uh, not constructive, not only towards Armenia, but also towards the organization. And second point, uh, during the preparation and negotiation of the agenda of the HDM, our delegation proposed to have a separate session on the human rights and humanitarian rights of people residing in conflict areas. And it was Azerbaijan who rejected this proposal. So uh, if Azerbaijan is keeping uh, this issue only as a right of reply, and is not interested in the, uh, uh, in the uh, comprehensive discussion of the rights of people residing in conflict area, it again uses conflict as a shield from very substantiated allegations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I don't have any uh, further uh, statements or uh, anyone, no one else has requested the floor to, to reply, lose the right to reply. But as I mentioned after the statement of the Turkish uh, ambassador, I would come back to the issue that he raised in his uh, statement. And I just want to mention here to, to clarify uh, the issue that he raised, that the Helsinki document of 1992 uh, called for increasing the openness of OSCE activities and to expanding the role of NGOs. The participating states, they decided to facilitate during OSCE meetings, informal discussion meetings between 
culture of participating states and of NGOs, and to provide encouragement to NGOs to work organizing seminars on OSCE-related issues. Furthermore, in its decision number 476, the OSCE Permanent Council decided that all non-governmental organizations having relevant experience in the field of human dimension will be invited to participate. In consultation with the Austrian OSCE chairmanship, uh, we came uh, to the conclusion that there is no consensus among OSCE participating states on the interpretation of the provisions of Chapter 4, Paragraph 16 of the 1992 Helsinki document, and that in absence of consensus, uh, other than the application of the UN sanction list, it has been established practice to implement these provisions in favor of broadest possible participation of HDIM. I just wanted to make this, this clear here in the end of, of this session. But I think with these words, I, I conclude uh, this session. I thank all of you for your uh, participation and important statements. And uh, we will now have uh, a lunch. Any technical information to share? No, okay, then we have just a lunch break and uh, wish you a, a good break. Thank you. <laughs>